G'day and welcome to AOS Coach and I'm excited to have this interesting conversation that has been a couple of years in the making. I did do this in like 2017 or 2018, very early on in the channel where I had a wonderful conversation with a friendly local game store owner where we kind of, you know, peeled back the curtain a little bit to understand a little bit more about what it takes to run a store, to, to either support that store, or even I know some of you are thinking about maybe how do I get employed by the store. So I guess I, this might actually kick off a little series around careers around Warhammer and how you might turn your hobby into a profession. And I'm joined by Jordan from Warpfire Minis, um, one of my not only affiliates, and I appreciate the support that you give me, Jordan, but you're also the business owner of Warpfire Minis. You are a competitive war gamer. You know, we got to play next to each other at the Las Vegas Open. You were at the World Championships last year. You are a Warpstone enthusiast mm -hmm. and you have an incredible YouTube channel as well that you should check out, folks, after this video. But Jordan and I are going to have a, quite a robust conversation that the Discord community had given me a bunch of questions. I have a bunch of questions. Who knows where this is going to lead to? But hopefully by the end of this video, we'll have a good idea of what it takes to actually run a store. If I wanted to maybe aspire to eventually run my own game store, or maybe I just want to pick up some casual work, uh, or maybe I just get a deeper appre appreciation of the people who are servicing my community. So I'm going to stop for a second, introduce Jordan, and welcome him to the channel. Hey, everybody. How's it going? <laughs> Man, it's absolute pleasure to have you. You've been watching your channel for a long time. We chat on Discord. Uh, you're, obviously, you're an affiliate. I'd love to buy from you if I was based in America, but I'm yep. not. But let, let's let's get in, let's get into this. Um, who are you? What got you into Warhammer? And uh, talk to me more about the Jordan story. All right, so I'm Jordan from Warfire Minis. Uh, for Warhammer, it's something as a kid, like I always looked at and thought was like super, super cool, but it's something that I could never afford to actually play. So we had one local game store, it was called Wolf's HQ, and you went in and it was a bunch of grumpy old guys playing Warhammer Fantasy. And even though they weren't friendly, the models and everything else just looked so cool. And so later on in life, uh, my brother Mike, he ended up getting into 40K. And so when he pulled the trigger, I saw him like, oh, man, getting in. And he told me that he bought his models used and that he got them for like around 50, 60 percent of retail price. I was like, oh, well, that's actually like I could do that. And so from there, I took the deep dive in, started looking around for used models, found some, started doing a little buying and selling myself, trying to just I had a bunch of Skaven guys. I wanted more Skaven guys. So bought and sold some used models here and there, kind of worked my way up. And now here we are. We've got a store. Make sure call you the Warhammer Hustler, not Warfire Minis. <laughs> what was your what was your first mini? Um, the first kit I ever got, it was the Island of Blood set for Warhammer Fantasy. So that was Skaven versus the High Elves. And my buddy Mark, he took the elves. I took the Skaven guys because they were the absolute coolest. And it was for fantasy. We both built our armies. We were super excited. Um, we started painting them, and then we both sat down to play a game against each other. And we just couldn't do it. Like we were looking through the rule book and we're like, gosh, what's going on? Like, what does this mean? And we struggled for like four or five hours and we both quit and <laughs> never touched the game again until Age of Sigmar dropped. And then we met up at a local game store, played against the people who knew what they were doing. They helped us get our get our feet there and ended up having a great time. No, that's that's such a cool story and such a unique story, which kind of is a represents you one as a skaven player and some of the ingenuity you have but two actually doing some research and you know obviously chatting with you and finding out a little bit about your story about setting up your own store uh, store uh this makes perfect sense that you have, you have got that hustler gene in you. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, I was uh, get always getting like cards and marbles and Tarzos bears, always hustling, right? Get the extra extra couple of dollars to spend. And um, man, that box was a good box, Island of Blood. That's such yeah, yeah, a good that box. it was solid. Like I've still got the models, man. So like we're we're doing it. It's one of the boxes that is probably most um, requested to come back. Like you always see people asking for the Isle of Blood, and you know what? With all with the old world. They eventually made because um, the rat ogres in that box. The were, rat ogres, yeah. Like, what are we doing? Fire. We got these old ones when they came out with these awesome ones. Like, just give us those, man. Yeah, they had the ones who were like, come on, man. Like, it's at that. Just give me those rat. Those yeah. rat ogres are so so much better. Yeah. 
So let's talk your story. Let's talk about Warp Fire Minis. And uh, I've actually got some, you know, wonderful photos that you have supplied that I'll bring up in a second. But talk to me about your journey. So you started off as a casual gamer, picking up the Isle of Blood, playing a little bit. You, you, you went away. You came back during Age of Sigma. But how do you go from casual Age of Sigma, maybe competitive gamer, to eventually putting in equity to to go, I'm going to turn this into a career and I'm going to run a store. Are, are you a business person by trade? Is this something that you've done in the past? Like, tell me, tell me more. Yeah. So the business side of things, I originally started out working at my dad's semi truck junkyard. We uh, bought and sold Mack trucks specifically, and it was just used stuff. We go buy it from all over the country, and so that's something I just grew up in. Was He's going out buying used Mack trucks. We're exporting them out to different countries. Like we did a lot of business with Australia at one point. Um, they love Mack trucks down there too. And from that, like we did that for a while. Uh, we ended up get doing in shipping containers. And so I constantly was kind of on the on the go where I had to learn new things. So like semi trucks are one thing, shipping containers are totally different. And then Warhammer minis again, just three totally different things, but you can use a little bit of what you got in all of it. So getting going in Warhammer, like, again, I was just buying and selling the used models. For me, as the junkyard background and even the shipping containers, like, people like getting a deal. And so if I can give them used models, that's where I can provide value to them. Like, hey, here are these things you want. They're going to be about half price. Like, that's what everybody wants to get into the game because that's – the biggest gripe you hear about Warhammer is, oh, it's going to cost me five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars to get an army. So if I can cut that in half for people to get them in the game, like that's what I wanted to do. And and there's a there's a big market as well, like not just that, but it's people who, for example, uh, there's a war, uh, there's a Warcry box, for example, the uh, the hunters and the hunted, right between yeah, yeah, City, yeah. Cities of Sigma with the uh, Wilder Corp versus the Ogres. Now I look at that box and I'm like. I really want this box, but I don't play ogres. I don't want to have 50% of my spend all completely useless. And I guess that's where someone like you as well, uh, you know, can split those boxes or find those people you're like, oh, I missed out. And um, it's uh, generally, uh, as long as you're not price gouging, and some people do, but uh, for the most part, people are pretty, pretty good like that. It can be very, yeah. very valuable for that market too. Yeah, we don't do the box splitting. Uh, but like if somebody buys the box and they have these ogres that they don't want, like we do have a trade in program where they can just trade those back into the store. So that is something that some people do. And like everybody I know right now, they want those wilder core hunters for cities. Like future leaders are no, down, no. wilder core up. Let's no, go. no, they're, ter they're terrible folks. Go buy a bunch <laughs> of the, uh, the ogre gorges and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. sell, sell me the wilder core. Just like they're terrible. Fusilis, man, are the way to go. <laughs> But you, so you, you so you're buying and selling. You, you, yeah, yeah. You so trade, like you trade like this is all, all the stuff that you're doing before you eventually launch. What is Warp Fire Minis? And did, do I understand correctly that you were doing this on like eBay and like was it buying sales or like how how do you, how are you distributing at that particular point? Yeah. So at the very beginning, it was just me in my house. Like I would look around on Facebook and eBay and Craigslist at the time and any sort of online marketplace just trying to find big lots of things. Like it's hard to get really good deals. And so if you're buying a big volume of things, like if you're buying a $500 lot of stuff and then you can break it down and try and make a little bit. And at first, most of it was just like, I, again, I just wanted to have more of more hammer guys for me so I could make 50 bucks on this lot, go buy a box and uh, like we're living good. And just over time, I kept just buying and selling more. And so like I'm waking up earlier in the morning before I go to work to like pack up boxes and to go to the post office, drop it all off, then go to work. And it eventually got to the point where like, okay, like this could be something, but I, the hard part is finding the good deals. And so trying to figure out how can I get more of those good deals is kind of what led into the trade-in program. So like we can give you that same 50% or so of what you're going to get from the used models if you sold them yourselves. If I can give that to you a new in box stuff, like it's just saving you the hassle of trying to do it. Because sometimes you, you buy that big $500 lot and it might take you six months to sell all of it. And then some of it might not sell at all. So doing the trade-in program, you just come in, hey, I've got this stuff. You're going to get your store credit right away. And so that was one way to get more used things in order to sell more used things. And 
at first the selling new things there's just so many people who do it online so when i was looking at it at the start like youth models is where it at like i i who am i like nobody's going to buy new stuff for me when they can they can go on amazon or they can go on ebay or whatever other big retailers there are like it's going to be difficult for me to get my foot in the door there where with used models like i know that i'm just giving you good deals what is everybody like getting a good deal and so we let people trade in their used stuff we got the account set up with gw um and that was we had our shipping containers company that we were doing and so we had the one of the requirements is you have to have a brick and mortar store to get a games workshop account and so we converted out the shipping container i had to send them pictures like go through a little interview process submit a bunch of forms talk to the people there and it just panned out that we talked to the right people at the right times and they got us that account and so that's what let the trade-in program really take off we're now we got a bunch of used models coming in and now we're selling new models too but at first I'm sorry if I'm going on too long, but at first no, we... no, 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 please, please, please keep going. It's fascinating for me. I'll, I'll give you a, a break to just to have a sip of water. Um, but you, this is absolutely great. I think for me, what I'm hearing so far is if I was somebody, let's say it's Anthony right now who wants to set up a game store, probably the first thing most people think about is hiring a store, having to get inventory hiring a person to work there, uh, all of the things to build up a traditional bricks and mortar, you definitely have the online space, but that's really tough. So for me, just hearing your story, and I can't wait to hear more, it's fascinating how you've taken such a simple concept like um, buying bulk Warhammer, being able to then flip it for a profit, and then it's eventually led into a, tra a trading program, which I'm sure when you started this very first off, you never thought about this as like a business step, like it was never your goal, but it just constantly evolved, evolved, evolved. And now here we are about to talk shipping containers and an evolution that is about to eventually become a legitimate bricks and mortar store. Not to say this isn't legitimate, yeah, but, yeah, it's yeah. Just this but it's this interesting evolution over time how yeah, it's keep going, please. Okay. So from there, we got the trade-in program going. And the way it used to work with Games Workshop is people could tell me, like, hey Jordan, I want it, I want these products. I could order them in. Next week we would get the products in. And so I didn't have to have a ton of overhead because I was just doing ordering for people. And that was going pretty smooth. Sometimes you run into an issue where like they want a land raider, you ordered land raider. It takes six weeks to come in and now they're not so happy. I'm not so happy because like, I want to just get things. We want to be rolling. Like I promised you a land raider. I want to give you this land raider, please. So from that, we had to work our way up for a very long time. And the, over that time, the, the ordering part shifted to where now you order something and it's two, three, four months until you get it sometimes. And for me, that was just unacceptable. Like it's it's not okay for me to make someone wait. Even if I tell them like, hey man, like I was very direct and upfront with them. Like I'm gonna order this. It's gonna may take X amount of time. I don't know when they're gonna ship it. And so eventually we just worked up until we had enough capital. And even while we were still in the shipping containers, we built a second shipping container. And I ended up ordering, I think one of just every single product they have. Like this was a big chunk of change. I don't remember what the exact number was, but it was more than I was really comfortable with. But I knew that having fast shipping times and having this stock on hand is the only way for me to go forward. Like, I will not do business where you're waiting on me four months to get you something. It's just not right. So if I wanted to continue, this was the move. And so we pulled the trigger, ordered everything, built out this other container, and then boom, now we've got the, all of these new products. We've, if you order online from us, like I'm going to ship it out to you that same day or the next day. And that's really what set things off when we had everything on hand ready to go. What inspired you to, like, that's crazy, like to think that you've had this shipping container uh, <laughs> and obviously having some, you know, background in the logistics kind of, I'm sure definitely helped you. Um, what made you make that commitment and jump like surely you could just keep working with your dad or keep working um somewhere else and not have all this capital and risk and you know 
all these unknown happening right now, or you could just keep doing what you were doing, which was flipping, buying, sell, splitting. Um, I know a lot of people, uh, it's always fascinating when I look at Facebook marketplace where people are selling Warhammer and just the value that you get by stripping your minis, like just getting the paint off them uh, will just increase the value exponentially because people don't know how to strip minis, which is crazy. Go YouTube it. It's a very easy <laughs> process uh, or it's actually more beneficial to me to, to know how to strip. But what made you make this commitment to go, right, I'm now all in. I'm now going to be a Warhammer distributor. I'm going to start selling product and, and turning that side hustle of stuff that happened before work into much more of a career. Okay. So a big part of it was through time, like I started out with the semi-truck business, right? And what happened with that one is we, we did well for a long time. And then there was a presidential election in Nigeria, who was our biggest market at the time. And the former dictator of Nigeria, Buhari, he won the election and he essentially like shut down their country from sending money out to stop corruption. And so like overnight that business failed. And then I have a junkyard now full of things nobody wants. What am I going to do? And from there we shifted into shipping containers. And at that same time, like I have this failing business, I have this property that we have, I need to do something. So we got shipping containers. I like playing ping pong. So I had some ping pong tables like manufactured in China. Like I spent a couple thousand dollars having some like logos put on some ping pong tables and I'm gonna try that. Like Warhammer, this is something I love. Let's, let's, let's try something on that. And was just essentially, I was slinging mud trying to see what was gonna stick. And so, for the containers, that's what stuck. Like the containers, that's what was doing well. And having the container let us have the store. And then having the store in the container let us have it without any really without any real overhead. Like my employees was just me and my brother. We were already working for the container place. Our rent didn't exist because we're just in a shipping container. So traditionally it's very hard to start a game store because of those things. Like rent is just killer. Then employees, like you're you're paying a lot for employees because you have to, like they deserve to have a living wage and like live good too. And those just add up so fast and you've got to sell so much product right out the gate, otherwise you fail. Where for us, we had this kind of safety blanket of, hey, we're in this container, there's no real overhead, we can slowly work our way up and be okay. But the big leap into Warhammer again, what made me like order all the products was, this was right around when the pandemic was hitting. And that was a part of why those shipping times for GW got so bad. Like we're waiting three, four months because a lot of the shipping containers were held up. And at the same time, those shipping uh, companies are held up with those containers. The prices on shipping containers skyrocketed because the companies didn't want to sell them at all because they were making so much on the freight due to the high demand due to all the backlog. So we went from a failing semi-truck business to a failing shipping container business because I literally couldn't buy any shipping containers. Like. What is a store if you don't have anything to sell? So again, we're kind of, we're slinging mud. Like this Warhammer stuff's been going pretty good. Like not awesome. Like we're not paying our bills, but this is something that has been working. Like if we go all in level, like maybe this can pan out for us. And if I could pick shipping containers or Warhammer, I'm going to pick Warhammer every time. It's way more fun. So I'm really glad that it worked out the way it did. I love the entrepreneurial spirit and, you know, this was never a part of the plan to begin with. And again, I hope people at this particular point of the conversation are not thinking to themselves, well, I don't have a shipping container business. I don't have, I, I live in an apartment. I don't have the space for a shipping container. You know, yeah. I can't do this. And I, and I hope that's not what you're thinking here. I, I want people who are maybe listening to this, aspiring to one day own their store, thinking about how that they might take their journey, their skills and their experience and maybe let, learn the lessons and how you might use that entrepreneurial mindset, whether it is getting the capital to buy, get the rent, maybe it is a side hustle to build up equity in order to move over uh, and eventually launch what is we're, we're sure we're about to talk about, which is your actual bricks and mortar kind of transition to a store. But hearing that, that you had a very untraditional approach is very exciting. And I'm sure Games Workshop is not going to give you a license for your garage. Uh, <laughs> we're not Jeff Bezos here. We can't launch Amazon from our garage, at least for Games Workshop, because that they just won't do that. Yeah. But 
I'm hearing some fascinating collaborations and I'm hearing people who are, I know there's one store in Australia, for example, and I may or may not be getting this wrong. They work, they work out of a, um, a traditional bricks and mortar. That's not a Warhammer store, but they sell Warhammer products. They're able to um, work within the parameters of the, uh, the, the licensing agreements and uh, what games workshop determine in order to sell their product. So either way, either way, look at look at look at this and and maybe hopefully get inspired by uh, what people's journeys are. But you've got your shipping container. You are running a uh, a business that is uh, profitable, but potentially not ultimately being a full time career for you and not paying all of the bills. How did you then transition to what is your very beautiful, very well stocked? Uh, love the love the person at the front counter, and no doubt as you or uh, your your clone, but <laughs> how do we get to this point? This is not this is not a small store. This is not a little little nook and cranny. This this is quite large. Yeah, so this is year five. So like overall, it's taken some time to get here, but really, what what took us over the the hump was like we had all of the product on hand, ready to go, and like we just do what Games Workshop does, but better. And I tell them that on the phone. I was just talking to our rep today trying to like pep them up like they need to step their game up but like if you order something from us i'm going to ship it out to you right away why because that's the right thing to do i have it i'm going to send it to you like there's no reason for me to wait a week and then ship it to you if i have it like here you go it's coming your way when people want warhammer they want it fast because like you're excited you the new rules just dropped i want this new unit put it on the table right away and play so that's where we're trying to give it to you and then customer service side like we're human beings, like my staff, I think that we're excellent, but sometimes we do make mistakes. If we make a mistake, we're gonna bend over backwards to make it right. Like I'm not out to get anybody. If something goes wrong, like we're gonna get you taken care of. And there's some times where like, I'm gonna lose money on an order to make this right. And that's okay. Like we made money on the other orders. If, if we lose a little bit on this one to do the right thing, that's no problem at all, let's do it. And then the last thing for GW, like communication, Sometimes like we got we got a big order in the other day. It was supposed to be this huge, massive restock. And instead of it being all of the things we're out of stock on, it was 21 cases of Chaos Black Spray Paint. Like they just totally botched our order, didn't send us anything. And what I do is I, I communicate that to our customers. Like I'm, I'll make a Facebook post about it. I'll send an email out. And like, hey guys, like I know inventory sucks right now. This is what happened. And every step of the way, if anything goes wrong or even if things are going right, like I want to communicate with our customers to say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what's going to happen. And in my mind, that's what people want. They want to know what's going on. They want their stuff fast and they want you to be kind about it. Yeah, that, I couldn't agree more. If I think about, look, we all know that there's logistical challenges. You know, it's still happening to this day, even though COVID is over. There's definitely kind of things happening at a world level that is interrupting uh, our, our game and our hobby and you know a lot of things unfortunately are out of your control if i wanted that that um particular model and i ordered it from you i wanted an asap you want to give it to me asap but there are things sometimes out of our control and i agree wholeheartedly that you should be upfront, let them know and uh, i think you get a better outcome by being completely transparent than trying to hide it or you know remaining silent because then the next time i go to purchase i have doubts maybe that, you, that you'll fulfill it so i'll just go somewhere that maybe it's on shelf immediately because that's probably one of the challenges and we will talk about this and i'm curious to get your take is inventory management and the the um people want things instantly you know people don't want to wait and it must be tough, especially for some retailers who don't have a large warehouse. They can't have all the product on shelf. They can't have all the product lines on. And I'm sure there's a lot of other games that you want to support and, and, and you know, whether it's hobby tools or paint lines, like you want to have everything. But that's idle money sitting in your inventory. But it's yeah. also if you don't have that pro acro line and that's what they really wanted, they will, might go to your competitor as opposed to wait the week or two it takes to get there. So it's a fascinating kind of how you manage that, the relationship, but also the inventory. 
Yep. Inventory is the biggest challenge, like without a shadow of a doubt for us. And, and that's even with us, like I'm trying to stock it all. Like every week we're like anything we're out of stock on, like I reorder it. I am the guy who does all of our ordering. So like every work, every week I'm spending hours and hours and hours combing through our inventory, trying to figure out what are we low on? What are we out of reordering it? And then it's just a waiting game. So like, I've got orders like right now we're getting some stuff from like late December that we ordered that's now starting to come in. And you also have to try and predict the different shifts in the metas and stuff like that cuz the meta does drive sales. Like Warhammer players all of us like to win games. We want to have the good models down. And so like if the, if I think a unit is going to be hot, like I need to have these extra boxes on the shelf ready for and that's something where, like, I wish I was in the early release program or something where I could know what's going to be good, what's going to be bad, but I'm not. Like, I find out everything when it goes on the Warhammer community site, just like everybody else. So a lot of it's just seat in my pants. I've got to stay in tune with the community as best I can and try to get it right. And sometimes I do, a lot of times, and then sometimes I get it wrong. Like, I think my biggest miss lately, they had the Ripa's Snarl fangs were coming out for Gloom Spike Gits. And I saw those guys up for preview, and I'm like, man, these guys look so cool. People are going to love these. And I ordered, I don't remember how many boxes, but nobody bought them at all. Like, I, I haven't I, touched mine. Yeah, yeah, maybe we sold like five boxes or something, but I went in big, and I just totally whiffed. I, well, that's an interesting part that maybe we'll deviate uh, eventually. Uh, we're talking community right now, and I'd love to learn a little bit more about the community and how you know, I guess they keep the lights on and then maybe un unpack a little bit more about the commercial side of things. But I, I know when Dominion, for example, came out and it's been oh. fascinating because Dominion, the Age of Sigma third edition box, it seems like that, go back to 40K. When 40K sold out, uh, was it Indominus? Uh, I can't think mm -hmm. of the box. Yeah, that was like that, 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 they undersold, like there was just so like the demand was so high that it disappeared completely. Then people were buying stock and it would arrive like four or five months later because they had to go and make more product. But then they kind of went, well, we're not going to make that same mistake again. And there's going to be lots of dominion and it didn't really sell. And oh, man. like, so like, the cool dominion boys, like they the, did us the inside scoop on that one. Yeah, please. Do you, do you mind if you're moving your microphone just a little bit closer? Yeah. I think you, you're dropping it. Okay. Yeah, it might be dropping out a little. Correct, keep going. Yeah, tell me the scoop. Tell me your side. Okay, so Dominion, what happened is this is kind of in the middle of the pandemic years, and mm. the way Games Workshop was handling things is they were putting really heavy caps on how much things you can order. So, like, a new release is coming out, you're going to get five boxes. And that's a bummer, man, because people, they want to buy the new release. And if I only get five boxes to sell, I've got 50 customers or however many at the time. Like, that means 45 people are just going to be bummed. And they're going to have to shop somewhere else. And I may lose them as a customer forever because of it. And it didn't matter how many I wanted. I'd say I want 100. I'd get five. Like, that's just, that is the hard cap. Which sucks. It, just, which just sucks. Like it yeah. sucks completely. Because, like, if, I, if I'm if i a regular customer of yours and I'm like, hey, my army is getting impacted for the first time in three years. And we think of, like, the, the cycle. It's like, yes, it's the new Skaven book. And I want to go pick up the X, Y, and Z. And... I just didn't get it. I'm like, well, I'll go somewhere else. Or, you know, yeah. why can't you get, like, I don't understand. Why can't you get me enough product? Oh, there's a, there's a limit cap. Yeah. And so they, they were doing that for like the longest time during the pandemic. And then Indominus hit and they let us, like, we had a pretty good cap number on that one. So like everybody got a pretty good amount of Indominus. Demand was through the roof. So everybody sold every copy of Indominus they had. And like, this was for the first time in years, like, Finally, the store's like, yeah, we made a victory. Like, we took, we got a good hit there, feeling good. So now Dominion's coming up, and everybody's like, ooh, yeah, like, this is going to be my chance. Like, we're going to do good just like we did on Indominus. And so they put out the email, like, hey, guys, no caps. You tell us however many boxes you want, and we're going to give them to you. And so all the stores are pumped. We're like, yeah. So I think we got, this is, we were much smaller at the time, and I think we ordered, I think, 200 boxes of Dominion. and I don't remember how many thousands of dollars that was, but it was a big, like, that's a huge chunk of change. Like, we're going to be living slim here for a while because, like, we got to get these Dominion boxes. And so we ordered the 200 boxes. Then release is coming up, and Games Workshop says, hey, guys, sorry, 
we're going to have to cap you at, I think, five boxes. Maybe it's five or ten. Of Dominion. Of Dominion. So you're going to get five or ten, and that's at launch. But we're still going to make all the rest of the kits, and just everybody's going to get these five or ten at release. And then two, three months later, everybody's going to get the second wave, and like that's when everybody's going to do great. And so if this is the same story for everybody, that's okay. Like If everybody's in the same boat, we're all riding this together. The stores are going to do great. So launch happens. Everybody sells their five to 10 boxes because, like, again, the hype was real. People were excited for the new edition of Sigmar. And every, so every store sells out instantly. But Games Workshop doesn't. They leave Dominion up on their website for pre order where customers they can look around all over anywhere they want. And it's sold out everywhere but gamesworkshop.com. And so GW kept taking the pre orders. The entire time, they never sold out, never took it down. So for the two, three month stretch where we couldn't get any, Games Workshop sold all of them. And this was in the middle of all the caps. So all the customers, like you had the FOMO, man. like I got to, I'm just not going to get it. And so everyone who wanted a Dominion bought it directly from Games Workshop because that's the only place you could get it. So then queue up two, three months later, Games Workshop says, hey guys, get ready. Like, here's your second wave of Dominions coming. So, like, here's 195 boxes of Dominion that nobody wants. And so, every store that I know of, like, same story. Everybody, like, we thought this was going to be our one time we're going to actually like, do pretty good. And you got all these boxes after everybody ordered them and you couldn't sell them. So then people were selling. I remember Dim Dim Dominion boxes were going for American, like, 90, 100 bucks for the whole box stores are just taking a beating because like i invested this huge nest egg of money to do this and like i just got hosed so dominion big thumbs down i, I gave them a bunch of grief about that one like terrible yeah. terrible deal it's interesting because like you look at and i want to unpack that in a minute with you like yeah. I'll, the, you've got the the indominus box that is sold incredibly well so yeah. you're in like this okay cool well hopefully obviously 40k is bigger than sigma so you know, you have your anticipation is like, look, I'm not going to sell the same amount as 40k, but I should get a, you know, a good kick. And everyone's talking, a, you know, third edition had a lot of hype around it. Really nice stormcast sculpts. There's this new orc, orc war band that looks much more like that uh, real version, like in Lord of the Rings, as opposed to maybe the cartoony Iron Jaws. And, you know, there was a lot of buzz and excitement around the Cruel Boys. So anyone connected into the community would go, yeah, cool, I'm I'm going to buy this. This sounds like it's going to be another winner. Yeah. Um, as you've already mentioned, you know, you live and you die by, by the sword when it comes to your inventory. If you buy too much, you are going to be left with, you know, dead, dead money that is going to be just you could have been reinvesting into to tables, into community efforts, into new product lines, picking up that new, you know, Duncan two thin coats range that you've never stocked before. Like there's lots of things you could do with that money other than just sitting idle with Dominion boxes. Yeah. And then let then what must be frustrating for you, and I can only imagine how annoying that is for you and your customers, just having to work with that, well. Games Workshop selling it direct. We're all got our hands cuffed. And I understand why they do it. Like if you take the commercial side, most FLGSs will sell at a discount, whether it's 5%, 10%, or 20% off the recommended um, sale price. So if I want to keep more product and more profit, I would sell it direct. Makes sense. But the distribution channel, which is yourself, the community arm, the relationships, the, the things that you're doing, probably not the best outcome. Is this the only time they've, they've done this to you? Or Yeah, that was like, there have been a couple other things where they just like got something wrong. And again, like we make mistakes too. I get it. Sometimes orders get botched. And so there's been times where like, I think it, it, there's one year there's an Imperial Knight Christmas box that came out. And so... It said, okay, you're going to get, I don't know, 30 of them. And so we sell the 30 that we're supposed to get. And like the shipment comes in and we get 10. And so I call up my rep. I'm like, hey, man, like, we only got 10. You need to send me those 20 as fast as you can. I email all my customers, like, hey, guys, it's going to be late. I'm sorry, like, I've talked to my rep. He calls me back the next day, Jordan, they're all gone. I can't get you any. Like, there are no, these 20 boxes don't exist. And so as a person, I like to give people the opportunity to do the right thing. And so 
I talked to my rep and I said, man, like, I know you probably can't do this, but talk to the higher up. What made that box is it was, I think, a knight and two sets of armagers or two knights and a set of armagers, whatever it was. I said, what I need you to do is those 20 boxes, just send me the components to make up these 20 boxes. Like send me the knight and the armagers, I'll package them together. And that way the customers, they're getting the same deal and they're going to be happy. Like that's going to be good. And talk to the people and they just couldn't make it happen for some reason unknown to me. And so for me, what I did, I went through and I didn't have those products in stock. And so I went through and like added up the full retail value of the box. So if the box sold for 170, the actual retail value of it was $280 or whatever it was. And so I told the customers like, look guys, I'll give you $280 store credit. I can, or I can give you a full refund. Like that way you can use that store credit to buy the components when they do restock or use it to get towards anything else you want. And for me, that was the right, that felt like the right thing to do, even though I'm going to lose a bunch of money and games workshop didn't help us out at all. But for me, like I'm always going to do what's right because it's the right thing to do. It's a very easy decision. And it's, that was one of those, I was really hoping games workshop would back us up and do the right thing too, but swing and a miss. Has it improved? And I asked that knowing that I saw some similar things with um, the old world where, you know, stores had had, you know, a lot of demand for the Tomb Kings and the Bretonia boxes. And then I saw emails, I think was it might have been Element Games, or I saw some some communication between Games Workshop and an Element and or maybe it wasn't Element, maybe who knows, I can't remember who it was, but talking about those trade caps and then the the impacts of demand and then obviously you've got this this pool of audience that are so disappointed that that after 10 years the the tomb kings are back and i can't buy my tomb king thing and i'm frustrated right now that i can't buy bases they're just stupid bases i just want like little square you know bases for my knights let alone the shiny new thing like tomb kings bretonia the 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 terrain feature for example a lot of our terrain features in age of sigma are still not in stock if i started yeah. gloom spike it's yeah today, loon shrine, I, dude, could, dude, dude. I couldn't get a loon shrine i yeah. like if i started gloom spike today i could not get a loon shrine and and like well, since even the myself, book launch it's been like a year it's been over a year no nah, no nah, nah, there, there was a there, at least in australia i had a restock oh, maybe a couple of months ago there was a, there was a long stretch then yeah. there's like this small window where we got some and it disappeared again now I for the U.S., I haven't seen it. Like I got the email notifications, and I check all the time, like literally every day. Nothing. Interesting. Yeah. Which leads me maybe to, and like you know, not that I don't want, I don't enjoy the GW bashing. Like you know, we need to. <laughs> not, we, you, this, this, this is the pros and the cons of running yeah, the business. Yeah. What I'm hearing is the frustration and the challenges of not only managing inventory, uh, being well connected with the community, because it's certainly easier for you from an Age of Sigma point of view, because you are a competitive player. But what about the other games you stock, whether it's 40K, whether it's Kill Team, whether it's the non-GW stuff like, uh, let's say, Song of Fire and Ice or Bolt Action or knowing that Marvel Crisis Protocol has had a second, you know, a, a big new wave. So if I'm not as well connected into Marvel, do I go all in? Do I just, you know, how do I even understand how much Marvel that I have? I don't want, I don't want it sitting on my shelf and it's just, it's just money that's wasted. That's tough. So I think tr- for your traditional game store, like you need diversity and you need to cover a bunch of bases. And so like people, they stock Marvel Crisis Protocol, they've got Bolt Action and Team Yankee and the new Star Wars Shatterpoint and all these other games that come out. Most of the time, like you want to carry all of these things. So that way, like whatever is the hotness right now is what everybody's going to buy. When people buy things, you make money. So you need to be into all of these things. Like Right now, I think Disney Lorcana is the big hotness right now in America. And every game store is bending over backwards to get as much of this stuff as they can. And it's selling like hotcakes and it's great for them. Um, for me on a personal level, like we pretty much just do Warhammer. And it's not the best financial decision. It's just that's what I like. And so if I am going to sell you something, I need to believe in it. Like I need to know that I literally love playing this game. When I talk to you about it, you're going to be able to tell that I love this game and you're going to be excited to play it. Um, at the end of the day, 
the community is what sets like it's it's what makes a game like i don't care how good your game is you could come out with the best game ever and the rules are perfect and everything's perfectly balanced but if you don't have people to play it with it means absolutely nothing so that's where your local game stores kick in that's where we kick in like we have the play space when people come in like i'm talking to them about the game i'm teaching them how to play the game at a higher level i want them to enjoy it the same way that i enjoy it and I can do that for Age of Sigmar. Like I'm all in. Like I'm absolutely passionate about Age of Sigmar. For 40k, I know how to play. I can walk you through. I like the game. I like the models. For Disney Lorcana, I don't know anything about it, man. Like you want to talk to me about it, I can say that's a cool looking art card, but I don't know how to play. My time, like I like playing Age of Sigmar. That's what I'm gonna do. Like Song of Fire and Ice, man. That's probably a wicked cool game, but I like Warhammer, so that's what we do. So as a store, like. I've got Warhammer products. We've got all the Games Workshop lines. So we've got Middle Earth. Like I just built me a Hall of the Thranduil army. You want to talk Lord of the Rings? I'm in. Like I think it's really cool. The game is very different from Sigmar in a good way. So like if you just want to change a pace, like this fills that gap. And then we also carry Bolt Action. And again, it's just very different from 40k. Like if for there are some people who like the historical side of things. And so like I've got a British Army Desert Rats Force with a couple of Matilda tanks. We've got the Queen of the Desert on the board. Like, this is something I like, so I, I have no problem selling it to you. And on top of that, like, I'm going to give you the best deal I absolutely can because I want you to play this game and I want you to play this game with other people in my store and build this community. So when it's, the, the game store is kind of a rare thing where there's not a lot of places anymore where people are getting out of their house and just sitting down for three or four hours and talking to a stranger it's kind of a wild thing these days. And so for us to have this environment where you can come in, I'm gonna either play a game with you if nobody's here, or if there's somebody else looking for a game, I'm gonna go make an effort to link you two guys up so you guys can play a game and have a great time. And that's just like extremely valuable for the world as a whole. Like this is, I can look at the store and just say like, I know that I'm doing a good thing. Like whether we're making a killing or not, like I'm not a millionaire, I'm not gonna own a yacht, it's not gonna happen for me, but I know that I'm doing a good thing for the world by linking people together, sharing good experiences, like the game store rules in that aspect. I, I, I love that. And a wonderful segue to where I want to talk more about the, the community because the community is key to the longevity of a local game store. And, you know, as you were talking, I got thinking a little of a few things. First off, uh, a saying that I say a lot, and I want to reinforce at this particular point, you should pay where you play. I'm going to repeat that. Pay where you play. I can only imagine how frustrating it would be that people are 3D printing whole armies and then coming in and wanting to play at your store and not really spending. Or alternatively, people who are coming in frequently using your tables and not picking up product. Now, I imagine you don't charge for tables. And, you know, just because you go play at a store doesn't mean you have to go buy product every day. But in order to keep these stores alive, it costs rent, it costs employees, it's lights, it's all these things, insurances. This money has to come from somewhere. So, you know, I hope wherever you play, you are supporting in some fashion um, through product, through pre-release, you know, attending their events, do what you can, because you're right, you're not living on a yacht, you haven't got like this glorious mansion. But the last thing I want to do is, and I've seen this happen in my communities, where these stores collapse, because they, uh, they're not profitable, maybe they stretch themselves out too thin. And ultimately, they just can't sustain themselves in this niche of a niche. Yeah, it, it's, it is tough. And like, Again, for us, like we had that stretch where like we, we have, we're year five now. It took us a few years to where we made any money at all. And for like the traditional game store, it's tough. And you should absolutely like we are we sell stuff online. I would I'd love it and appreciate it when you shop with us. But definitely if you've got a local store where you go play, like shop there instead, man. Like I'm going to be OK. They need your support. Like definitely do that. Um, and sometimes, you know what, man? We're giving you the max discount we can. We give you customer rewards on top. Like I'm doing, I'm doing everything I can to give you the best deal. But if your local game store costs five dollars more, man, just give them the extra five dollars. Like they are pricing things where they need to. 
and that's okay. Like that, that extra five dollars, it's not going to make or break you. I know it might hurt your feelings a little bit, but just know that like that's going to help keep their doors open, and like that's the you need a place to play. You need that community, um, and the Age of Sigmar community and the Warhammer community as a whole is just great. Like me and you, we see each other at events. Everybody's having a good. I'm like. You're laughing. You're having a good time at the table. Some people are drinking beers. Like everybody's getting together after the games. Like it's just a great, wonderful thing. By supporting your local game store, you are helping keep that going at large. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. A couple of questions around the community that's come from my community, the the Discord community, is um, Johnny Vampire Un Undivided asking. Can you tell me a bit more about the demographics of how uh, how many people are players? So I, I imagine competitive or match play players versus uh, you know painters. You know people who maybe aren't really gamers. They come in, buy models, and all they want to do is paint them. They put them on a shelf, and they don't aspire to to, to play. Is yeah, I don't know the exact figure. Like it, it's it's hard because. I talk to people and like I can tell when people are playing games or not just by like how they're talking to me about the game. And then too, like anybody, somebody, anytime somebody buys models in the store, I am encouraging them to come in and play because I think it's a good thing to do. And some people like it doesn't matter how many times like I'll smile at them and wink at them, tell them like, hey, like come in, like I'll play you next time you come in. And they've just never played the game because like they're just not interested. And that's okay too. Like plenty of people just collect. Some people just like to build. Some people just like to paint. And those are all wonderful aspects of the hobby that like, if that's where you get your enjoyment, that's great. Do that. Um, if I had to wager a guess at it, I would say probably for people who play the game competitively, much smaller, but like people who play in general, maybe 70% play 30% collect slash paint some somewhere around there. Yeah. It's surprising how much, I guess, airtime match play gets, you know, there's a lot of tournament noise and channels like mine who are always talking about like competitive match play, match play, but this is big pool of people who don't care. They just want yeah, to they, the like team. the competitive pool. We're talking like 2% or something, man. Like it's very small, but this, they do have a big impact on overall sales because like the meta thing, people, even if they're not playing competitively, they look at like the list that came out and they're looking at the, what everybody's talking about on the discords and they're keeping taps on things. So they want to buy those good units and they want to play good armies. So even if they're not playing very often, they're still keeping in touch with everything that's going on. So the meta that that top two or 3% of the competitive players do have a big impact on things overall. By the way, I'm also jealous of those people. Like if I could just walk into a hobby store and just see the model, regardless if it's good, bad, or indifferent, and just go, I want to paint this. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't, couldn't care in the world. And they, they, they're not painting for a tournament. They just paint at their own pace. They do their own thing. Like I am jealous of you, hobbyists. So, <laughs> uh, you know, you live in a really good life. Untitled asking, does offering a place to play set you apart from an on online retailer and GW itself? And we know during COVID, um, I, I, obviously I can't speak on behalf of the entire world, but what I'm seeing is across the globe, Games Workshop, Warhammer stores have even really pulled back on um, gaming spaces and really they're just there for demos. Has that helped you set yourself apart from online and GW? And how does it go kind of to help maintain that community that you're building up and fostering? So play space is, and again, another tough spot. Um, for me, I prioritize it. Like we've got, I think, 13 tables that are permanently set up. And then for tournaments, we like, we bust out a bunch more and we custom built these tables. They've got a nice wide lip where you can put your books down, your war scroll cards. And we've got stools at all the tables so you can sit down. We got plenty of space. Like we really want it to be a nice place to play because I love to play the game. I want you to love to play the game. But financially, like we don't charge for the play tables. Like we just want you to come in and have a good time. And it eats up a lot of space. So for your traditional game store front, like should I have five Warhammer tables or should I have an aisle of Song and Fire and Ice and Magic and Lorcana? And the, the answer financially is like, you should have those other games. And I totally get it. Um, you need to still have like one or two tables at least to have some place where people can play. Cause like you do want to foster that community, but 
financially, like the, the traditional game store is tough. Like you, you need to make the money that you can to pay your bills. So like if you have to not have as many tables as you want, that's what you, you have to do to make it work. Um, for us, just again, we've been in it for so long. We've made it this far. Like I have the luxury of being able to have these extra play, sta play tables for people out. And it does help the community aspect of it. Like more people come in and play. Like on a Friday night, most of our tables are full. We got a bunch of people in here playing games. We got a 40K tournament coming up next weekend. We'll have like 24 people playing in that. And you need the, the, you need the table space to do all of those things. So it is a good, it's a good thing to do. And people like when they come in and they play, like they will still buy things. So like it does increase your sales overall as well. Um, but it's tough for games. Like I understand why some stores don't have it, but like I do prioritize that just again, because I like we're doubling down on Warhammer. We're tripling down. like Magic's not here, Lorcana's not here. Like it is Warhammer time. Well, it's interesting because my local store over the Christmas break has actually, um, it used to have, uh, it used to be able to host about 16 to 18 players at, I mean, we run like an RTT. Mm -hmm. um, I think they've dropped one or two tables over Christmas. So I think there's now only six to eight tables. Um, six to seven tables they've dropped it because they've added more shelf space yeah. and you're right like commercially and this is the challenge right is commercially it makes more sense to be viable by adding more shelves more product line more stock more uh different things like airbrushes and you know different paint lines and different hobby tools like wet palettes and things that maybe a, a shop wouldn't normally have but now i'm bringing in more more solutions but you're right how do you foster a community without areas to gain because now it's purely transactional and how do you differentiate yourself as a bricks and mortar store versus an online store where i can't play so it's it's a very funny interesting balancing act the the, the community side versus the the commercial side yeah and it's one thing like we are purposefully doing this to set ourselves apart as well like I want people to think about Warp Fire Minis in a positive light. Like, hey, that's a great place to go play. And man, they do really good events. And that's part of like, I go out to the events and I play myself. Like, I maybe should have a booth set up at a convention. I should be selling things. And, but I like playing the game, man. Like, I want to be in the tournaments. I, I want to go out there and I want to play at LVO. I want to play at the Kansas City Open. I want to be out there in the community, talking to people, shaking hands. I pass out little combat gauges and dice and stuff like that. Like being a part of the community i think overall helps out as well just raise awareness of like hey that's Warp fire minis oh that's jordan like we want to be the good guys in a realm where like games workshop saying hey you can't play in my store because you didn't buy the models here sometimes like you don't want to be that guy and anyone who's thinking about any kind of store like telling people they can't play in your store don't do that man like you there is no world where that's okay like if somebody wants to bring in a checkerboard and play checkers on my table, man, I'm going to go over there and play a game against you. Let's go. This is fascinating. There's a lot of questions I had very similarly, like I was reading like the, the bad mod, uh, talking a few things like very similar because I know in, in a lot of communities, you know, there's either no offer to play, like there's no space to play or potentially there's tables that are never really used. So um, it's a fascinating discussion on like the pros and cons on if I had more tables, I'd have more gaming, but that's less inventory space. If I had less tables, I'd have more product to sell, but I wouldn't have the space for the community. So it's an interesting kind of balance. Yeah. Like yeah. purely financially speaking, like maybe shell, but like you also want that community. You need tables. Like it's you as a person, like what are your goals for your store? Like, is it make money, die or die trying, or like, do you want to like maybe make a little bit less money and have have these kind of luxury things where people can come and enjoy them? It's I understand both avenues, so it's yeah. Obviously, it's up to you and your community and how much space you've got, and it, it, there is no right or wrong answer. But one one question I do have from Mortis and Monty, which is a fascinating one, because I think a lot of people will listen to this and they'll be able to identify at least whether it's themselves, most likely not, but maybe it is. Maybe they've got some really, really wonderful awareness. So Monty's saying, uh, my local game store, there is a ton of wonderful people who attended, me too, uh, and 
Uh, it's all around a lot of fun, but even the best stores, you do have inevitably have people who, there's that one or two people who are problematic in the store, whether it's poor sports, whether it's bad hygiene, whether there's, you know, other problematic issues and behaviours uh, that ultimately lead to some type of negative impact either, you know, behind the, behind the scenes or maybe, you know, just straight up don't want to play, don't want to be a part of an event. There's just problems with this person or persons. Um, what's your approach when dealing with people like this? And do you find that you have a, a solution or a way to be able to, uh, as Monty said, cut off the limb to save the body? Or like, what's your, what's your thinking and thoughts around this? Because it's not easy to be able to address something like this, but at the same time, you can't have it rotting away and impacting more of your community. Yeah, there's no easy answer to that one. Like, I will say that, like, as the store owner, it is your responsibility to do those things. Like, if someone isn't coming in and ruining everybody else's experience, like, you can't ignore it. It won't go away. If that person is doing that, that's who they are or how they're going to be. And if you don't say anything, that's just how it's going to continue to be. So. In the past, like that's very, very rare. We have a very, like, a great community. Um, but, like, in the instances where that has happened, like, I have either tried to just pull them aside personally and, like, you definitely don't want to do it in front of people. Don't make a big scene about it. Like, that's the wrong thing to do. But you pull them to the side and, like, hey, man, like, I know losing the game's tough, but, like, we got to dial it back a little bit. Like, I think it's starting to affect other people's play and other people's experiences. And you try and be as kind about it as you can. And, when I have had to do that, they received it well, and a couple of them have changed, and those who didn't just didn't come back. And at the end of the day, like I may have lost a customer in them by doing this, but again, it was the right thing for me to do, number one, so I'm going to do it. And then number two, like if this one person was ruining 20 other people's experiences, if they don't come back, that's the price we have to pay. Yeah, I think addressing it head on and also discreetly, right? Like, you know, be yeah, definitely don't make a scene about it. Like, that's the worst thing you could do. You don't want to embarrass anybody. You don't want to make anybody feel bad, like just pulling them to the side. Or if you're like, you know, that they have a close friend who's there, maybe you can talk to that close friend, like, hey, man, maybe drop some hints about, hey, we need him to tighten up a little bit, stuff like that to sneak your way in there. Yeah, and obviously, you know, like people have bad days, you know, sometimes some things happen, but when you have this problematic, systematic happening on a regular basis yeah, yeah, yeah. and multiple people are now talking, your brand is attached to it. You're like, oh, let's go have a game at, you know, Walk 5 Minis. And like, oh, no, there's that really bad player that comes to Friday Night Warhammer. Nah, let's go somewhere else. Or, yeah, and that, like, you know, that will happen. You have to address it. You cannot let it. You can't just ignore it. It won't go away, so even it sucks like it's not fun there's nobody loves it but it's something that you have to do as a store owner and you know for the people who are listening to this as well if you are having those experiences not that you got you know punched by the latest you know nastiest zinch list but you know there's something that's legitimately problematic as well my advice would be to, be to, to talk to the store manager don't just bitch about it behind yeah, the yeah, yeah. stores like just just do it discreetly like hey i've had this problem can you just keep an eye out you know and if there's things that are evidence building then it allows the, the store owner to be able to address it and say look i've had a number of complaints about you be very very logical this is what i'm hearing please please sort yourself out hopefully i don't hear you again if not i'm gonna have to take action and whether that's you know banning you from the store you know not allowing you to attend our events whatever it might be um that's at least what I would imagine what I would do. Yeah. But I'm not a and, store owner. Yeah, it's never I've never been to the extreme where I had to tell somebody like, look, you are banned from my store, don't come back. Um, like when you talk to somebody in a kind way and you treat them with respect, like it's going to be received well. And like the worst case scenario again is like that they if they are offended, they're just not kind to them, they're not gonna just freak out and start screaming in your face. So that's all you can do is be kind. Like that's kind of my mantra there. What about, um, and this is like a little deviation now, because we talked a little bit about, you know, having the various games and I, I, we, we started touching on the fact that you play Age of Sigma and, you know, how that helps you kind of stay on top of the meta and like what, what to buy and what not to buy. One of the things that I'm always curious about, um, because my local game stores run 
one day events. You know, you look at their calendar and, you know, one Saturday there's Age of Sigma, the next Saturday there's Blood Bowl, on the Sunday there's A Song of Fire and Ice, then there's Old World. There's, there's all these different games, as you mentioned. And the, the store owner is often the one running the events. So how on earth can you stay across games, the meta, the rules, you know, because you've got to sell them, you've got to sell the rules, you've got to sell the systems. And um, I imagine that is incredibly tough to be across so many different products and maybe why, as you mentioned earlier, you don't sell magic or you don't sell, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh cards because it's just, you just don't have the value to add to those customers. Yeah, the the answer for that for me is, a game typically for like a, a successful community to build, every game needs to have a champion of that game. So like for Age of Sigmar, you come in the store like, I got you, dude. Like anything you want to know, let's talk about it. I'll help you build your list. I'll walk you through the game, teach you the rules. I'll judge the tournaments when they come up. Then we've got uh, Ben from uh, Battle Brother. I, I'll look up his YouTube channel later, but Battle Brothers Tabletop. He, we, he works with us now and he's our kill team champion. Like if anyone has a kill team question, they want to do a kill team demo game, Ben is on top of it. So having a good team of people who can champion these games is what you need. Um, I am only one man. I can't champion them all. So like I am awesome at Age of Sigmar stuff. I got that down. 40K stuff, like I'm pretty okay. Kill team, I don't know anything. Like I know kind of the meta because everybody's talking about it in the office, but I can't master them all. And for there to be a community, somebody needs to be the master who can show people how to play and to play the right way. So whether it's you or your staff or even just local customers who you think are good people, you need you need help having other champions of these games for them to be successful. And that is a big part of like why we don't do Lorcana, we don't do Magic, we don't do all these other games. Like I don't have the time to champion them all. And the guys in the office, like we've got them already doing these other things where I could do a really bad job at doing this new game, but that's just not how I want to do things. So I imagine if I my local game store doesn't do Blood Bowl or doesn't do um, Marvel, right? And I really want to. You know, I'm really passionate about Marvel. I want to play Marvel. Um, I guess my role is to speak to someone like you to say, "Hey, I'd love to run an event. I'd love to do some Marvel stuff. I will help you." and be that champion because uh you're offering good space and hopefully that might lead to you stocking marvel product which ultimately benefits you and me i can now buy more marvel product and buy it off the shelf as opposed to waiting and you know for postage and things like that uh i get more players and i guess that's my role right my role is yeah yeah like store owners like myself offer. of that like and we had a guy, Vinny, moved to town, and he came in, and he was just passionate about Blood Bowl. And he's, Jordan, can I run a Blood Bowl league? Like, would you let me do that? And of course, man, I'm all in. Like, if this guy comes in, and he's excited about this game, he's going to do a good job. Like, he came in, and he ran a great league. Like, I, I had a Skaven team in it. I learned how to play the game myself, joined the league, and everybody had a blast. But you got to have that chance. That, that guy has to be there to do it. And if you're willing to do that for whatever game you love, like if it's Underworlds or whatever you want to play, if you go up to a store owner and you're passionate about it and you tell them about it and say that I want to help this happen, most game store owners are going to be definitely on board and help you do it. Yeah, and that's even true for Sigma. Like I know some people travel, you know, 30 minutes or an hour to get to a Sigma RTT. If there's someone close by, offer service, offer to build a relationship and... Uh, that's how you get, you know, more events. Because I imagine, you know, especially for those who are selling magic, um, you're competing with Friday Night Magic. You're competing with the volume of 40K. You're competing with the person's interest. If that person uh, loves their historicals, then they're always going to lean into Sword and Spear and Bolt Action and, you know, some of those other games because that's what I've always known. So be the change that you want to see in the world. You know, Absolutely. Like, like champion, like, be the champion, man. Get in there. Show people that you love this game. And the biggest thing, too, you have to consistently show up, like, every week. Like, if you're saying Saturday is the day I'm going to be there, like, you got to be there every Saturday. Because we're, we're, say we're three, four weeks in, and then you missed that Saturday, and that's the Saturday three new people showed up and you weren't there. Boom, you just missed out. So, like, if you are going up to a store owner and willing to make that commitment, and he's willing to help you, or, like, make sure that you're there and you consistently show up to help them make that happen for you. 
how else do you make that welcoming, engaging community around, you know, whether it's the events or the activities or do you encourage like painting classes, you do, do you do tutorials on airbrushing, like how are you bringing people in the door, as you mentioned, you know, I can sit at home and order product and, you know, never engage with my local store. What, what do you do to get me off my backside? So for us, like the things that we do every week, every Thursday is our Age of Sigmar night. Um, like we're open from 12 to 10 at night. Thursday, that's my night. So I'm like, I'm normally here till midnight, man. If we're, we're, we're all playing games, hanging out, like I like just watching games. I like playing games. Anything you want to do, I'm here. Um, but we're normally open till 10. And that's every Thursday. Every Friday, we do 40K. And then Saturdays, we do open play. We do events. Like we run tournaments. We have like, we call it sprue day. We get a bunch of extra sprues and bits and stuff in. And so sometimes we'll pop all those out and we'll sell it for like a dollar a sprue or when we did our grand opening, we just gave a bunch of sprues away. People came in and just like going like wild animals through these big boxes. Of sprues. Then we've got a couple like hobby stations set up where people can come in and paint. We've got paints and brushes and all that stuff out there that's just free to use. And the biggest thing is just like being warm and welcoming when people come in the store. Like if somebody walks in your store and you don't greet them and like ask how they're doing and like engage them in any kind of way, they're just probably not coming back. So it is like your duty as the employee or the owner, like you need to set the tone for your store. Like if, if you want it to be a warm, welcoming place, you need to be a warm, welcoming person. And then anything you could do, like running those events, like paint classes, any, anything you can do to help people come in is great. Um, again, like getting people off their couch and into your store you're they're helping yourself and you're helping them like they, it is a good thing for a human being to do to get up and engage and get out and hang out with other people no it's neat like there's so many cool ways you can do things and uh there's been some flgs's and by the way you definitely embody the f in flgs's like i'm feeling so many wonderful vibes and i can see why you know you've got such a really good reputation in the market because you're not just a retailer you are going above and beyond in the community people know who you are you're engaging you know your youtube channel as well allows you to kind of add value in a very different way but yeah I know where I was going with this, but I, but, well, I did want to appreciate it. Yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. I, I do want to compliment you. I, I actually had, a, I did have somewhere I wanted to take you, but it, it is interesting just what it takes to get people off their backsides. And there, I, I know for me, having a dedicated day has been very powerful. Yeah. Like I say to, I say to my community all the time, I'm going to be at this store on Thursdays. Let's have games. Even if I don't play, just knowing that the other games will be played, like other Age of Sigmar games are being played around, will get people off their backside. And even if I can't make this Thursday, I can come next Thursday or the Thursday after. And actually what worked, worked really well for a while across 2023 was simultaneously on that Thursday, there was an Age of Sigmar slow grow, slow grow league. So the experienced 2000 point match play people were playing on tables right next to the people who were playing 1000 and they could start mingle and asking questions and they could watch um, the games at a bigger scale and, and try to work out how they go from that 1500 point army up to 2k. So it was really good to cross pollinate and we could also add value and add tips and even encourage them like, Hey, I love your painting. Hey, that's really cool. And, that worked really well, like a informal mentorship and not that any of us were mentors, but like there was that big brother kind of, Oh, this is where I want to aspire to be <laughs> yeah. eventually. And, um, like I'm on my journey and it was kind of, it was really, really cool. And, um, you start to see the, the, the payment in the community overall and attendance grows and relationships like, Oh, I saw you in the store the other week and you, you start to foster those relationships. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Dedicated day consistency, like, people need to know if they're going to show up that they're going to get a game. And so that's where like, I'm always available to play a game. Like I will not let someone come in the store and like, they're looking for a game and not get to play. Like as a kid growing up, maybe I didn't have a bunch of people to play with. So I want to make sure everybody's got somebody to play a game with. Like we've got the guys on staff. Like if they, somebody comes in and wants to play kill team, like I'll, I'll take Ben, like, don't worry about packing orders, man. I'll go do it. Like get out there, play some games with people. And like, that's keeps people coming back. It gets them engaged in the hobby. And overall, like, long term if they're engaged in the hobby like it will equal to more sales for you overall 
but more important, like just doing the right, that is the right thing to do. Let's do the right thing to do. And it's all going to pan out from there. But how do you benefit from that? You're taking an employee from the tip counter fulfilling orders and you're putting them to play a game with one person. What's, yeah, so, the, what's the benefit here? Now, so, I, I think I know, but like, I just want to, yeah. I want you to articulate it. So like financially speaking, if we're looking at like, well, I paid this employee X amount per hour and they played three hours with this game, like one for one, it's not going to equate out. Like if they buy a $50 box of Marines afterwards, like I didn't make enough money to cover that employee's hours. But once somebody learns how to play, they're going to teach other people how to play. And there's just this chain that keeps happening. Like if somebody is engaged in the hobby and they love it, like they're going to keep buying models over time. They're going to keep coming in your store. They're going to bring other people with them. They're going to buy drinks. They're going to buy snacks. Like it's about the long term versus the short term. Like over time, it's going to work out for you. Yeah, no, that makes that makes sense to me. I imagine because nobody wants to go into a store and I went all to this effort to take time out of my day to walk into a store to have my army packed up. I want to play a game, Absolutely. and there's no one to play. Yeah. Or the same is true. I got into my car. I drove to the store. I wanted to buy those Marines. I wanted to go pick up the latest box of X, and it's not on shelf. And it's like, well, that's what I really wanted. Uh, I got off my ass to go buy them. And yeah. now they're not there. Do I wait around and hope for the best? Or in your case, you're able to fulfill at least a game. Um, while there's, that, there's always that this self-gratification that people want immediately. Um, so I imagine the relationships and the rapport and the, uh, the demonstration of goodwill really helps you go look you know what i can get it for you you know yeah you, you maybe order it with me and I'll, I'll i'll go i'll bat for you yeah absolutely like if you are kind to people like in return they will show kindness to you like if they say you tell them, hey it's going to be three or four days before that comes in if they've had a good experience in your store they're saying okay yeah no problem like i'll wait on you like that's okay and like that's li literally how it works and even in the online marketplace like I'm out of stock of stuff all the time and I ordered every week and I'm trying my best to get it in. And there are a lot of people who like, they will just wait and order it from us anyways. And there's a lot of people who they go to eBay, Amazon and buy it from XYZ warehouse. And like, that's cool too, man. Like if you need it for a tournament or something, like I, I totally understand you need to do what you need to do. But by being a part of the community and like, we're real people, like we're playing the games, like we love it. Like there is value in that and people see that. Yeah, I think being a part of the community, and again, I only can talk about on behalf of Sigma, which I know you you definitely are, but being a part of the community it makes you, I guess you transcend you more from just faceless store to being one of us. And that probably goes a long way. Mm. Which maybe like Gato um, had asked the question that I'm always fascinated with, and, and I'll explain why in a second, but Gato has said, um, how do you manage smaller games that may or may not be as profitable um, when planning out your your stock and your and you know your the way you do business, right? Because you look at Kickstarter, you look at um, the gaming industry as a whole, and there's always constant evolution, and there's always new games, whether it's board games, whether it's tabletop miniature war games, um, you know. FLG, Frontline Gaming has just launched their own game, Blood, uh, Blood Sacrifice, Blood something. Like Blood this game is happening. But like, this game's all the time, right? Um, and for you, it's like, do I stick with this, the, the tried and true Space Marine that I know is going to sell all the time? Do I put stock and trust into a new game system and maybe get burnt? Do I not support them? And then that game, which could have been amazing, never actually rises up. How do you even gauge the appetite for these smaller games and why do you give them a chance if you do or what would you need to see for, to, for you to give them a chance? So again, for me, like I just double down on Warhammer. Like all these games are coming out and I'm sure they're great, but like if I can't play the game with someone else, it, it, it doesn't have value to me. And so that makes it tough for the, all these new games that are coming out. Like, it's tough to build that community. It's tough to get people to buy in and they got to buy these models. And then they're worried, like, I'm going to spend this two, $300 on this new game, play it once. And 
in a lot of cases, like that's what happens. That's the reality of it. Yes. And so yes. like it's a strong word, but I, I hate game jumping all the time. Like just some places will just go from store or from game to game to game to game to game to game. Just encourage you, oh, this is a new thing, you gotta buy this. Oh, this is a new one, you gotta buy that. Like find the game you love and just do that really well. I'm like, if that's Warhammer, great. If it's Song of Fire and Ice, that's great. Like you could be the champion, like the number one place that's doing that. And if you build a good community around it and are part of that community, it's going to work out for you. Um, gauging like interest in the Kickstarter games and all that kind of stuff. Honestly, I, I don't have a lot of experience in that, like to, to tell you, uh, just because I haven't chased that. Just we have the space where we could, like now we've got a little bit of capital where I could chase that stuff. But like, I just love Warhammer, man. I think what I'm hearing from you, and I guess there's two faults, right? I could be everything to everyone, and there's an argument that, you know, you could be doing Dungeons and & Dragons, and you have Dungeons and & Dragons books on your shelf, and you organize um, Dungeons and & Dragons, like, role-playing sessions on, you know, a, a dead night, you know, Monday night D&D. Awesome. Like, there's definitely a way to attract that, but then that takes capital and effort, and, and there's definitely challenges there or to what you're doing, which is definitely focusing on a niche and just being really good at your target demographic. And that to you is the Warhammer ecosystem. You know, you're not trying to be something that you're not. And is there, is there, and, I, and like looking over some of the questions that I've been asked, you know, would you be better off doing discounts? Would you not be better off doing discounts? Would you be better off selling magic cards or not magic cards? Would you be better off selling, um, more product with inventory or you know having more tables um that people can play on these are all the decisions that a business owner needs to make and there is no right or wrong answer from what i'm hearing it's definitely what you you as an individual believe and what's important to you and what your community better most responds with and i guess it's the trial and error like yeah sure uh, you, there might be a time where you wish you had more money and more product and there was a sexy new line that you wish you had backed. But then again, there's, there's ones that you've avoided and you know, you're know you here to your day lessons and lessons learned. Yep. And like, like you're saying, there's, there's no wrong answer. Like you, all of these avenues are viable. Just what has worked for me on a personal level is like follow the thing that you love, do it at an excellent level and like people will see that people will appreciate it and like over time it's it, it'll work out these are your guiding principles these are this is your true north it's a yeah. you know what my business is all about it's about warhammer it's about relationships about people um having a good time it's doing the right thing and which you know which leads you to some of the decisions you've made and i guess uh, I can only respect that because a local game store as i mentioned can be everything to everyone and you're not looking after yourself. Yeah. So one thing I do want to talk to you about, which I think is fascinating, because as the front, uh, the, the FLGS kind of evolves, you've seen 3D printing come in, and some, I don't, I don't know if you do this, so I'd be curious to hear if you are or why you, why not, but you could you could be offering 3D printing services, things like um, bits or basing and, you know, being a commercial licensee and, and 3D printing where people who don't want to buy a resin printer, you can at least go to your, your local store and get it done for you. Um, I love the fact that you sell used minis on your website. And there's a couple of game stores that I know of where um, Sometimes I do want to find a, a maybe an out of production model, or maybe there is a model that you know um, I don't mind if it's built. So I just want to buy something cheap to to paint. I love that you you've got different ways, and you as you've said, diversified ways to bring different customers in. Can you tell me more about your your um, your secondhand mini market? You know where you stand with three D printing, like all these other little interesting ways that you could or may bring new customers into the door other than just new stuff. Okay, so for 3D printing, I'll start off, I think that it's really cool. I have a resin printer, I've got a couple FDM printers, like this is something I too have experimented with. Um, for people who are deep in the hobby, I think it's a very useful tool, like printing out cool bits, like my, my Skaven converted Salamander army that I've got for 40K. They've got special Warp Fire shoulder pads with the Warp Fire logo that I 3D printed. And I think it's awesome, dude. Like, that's just wicked cool. Um, 
what I don't like is when you're just copying one for one, printing out like Games Workshop models. Like agreed, agreed and again, wholeheartedly. Yeah, like I just don't think that it's the right thing to do. And at one point in time, I was looking at they had the the Salamander for Seraphon back in the day, just a terrible model. Like Fuck nobody, garbage. nobody liked this thing. And so I started contacting some places when I got into the 3D printing. I was trying to find a 3D sculptor and like, hey man, like I think I could come up with like a really cool Salamander sculpt. Could you make this for me? Then like I'll start printing these out and just sell them as a proxy. And I think that that's a really cool way to go. Like, hey, you don't like the look of this model. Here's an alternative that's the same size ish, but it's a totally different thing that I think is cool. And that's that's somewhere where I think 3D printing could like really do well. And for our store like policy people coming and playing games, I tell them for casual games and like regular games in the store, I don't mind if you bring 3D printed models. Like I understand it. It's gonna be a thing. Like I'm not gonna be a jerk and kick you out of my store and all these kind of things. But when we do like official events and official tournaments, we do want it to be genuine GW models. If you've got some converted bits on there or something like that's fine. Like that's cool. But we just don't want full printed models and as a store, like I don't charge for the tables. Like we charge like a dollar for a drink or a snack. Like we're not killing you guys. Like I know 3D printing is cool, but at the end of the day, the only thing I do is sell models. So like we do want you to buy models eventually. Like if it's one every six months, like that's fine. But if you're just 3D printing full armies and bring them in, and then when you come in, you're loudly talking to everybody. Oh, I 3D printed this. I saved two hundred dollars and all this kind of stuff. Like it's not helping our store at all. And like we are bringing some value, try and like help us out a little bit, man. What, um, what about offering a service? Like for example, uh, an, a website that I'm obsessed with right now, and uh, I will be in contact with your website if you happen to be listening to me, is um, a company called Epic Basing. And um, one of the things that I really love for 3D printing is just doing basing bits. Oh, Little yeah. simple things like, you know, they've got some incredible um, foliage and plants that, you know, uh, I can put to make my Seraphon army look more seraphon -y. Or mm -hmm. I could get, you know, dead trees as, uh, that I can be putting on bases. And it's a really interesting type of uh, basing or even little 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 bits that you put on, whether it's, you know, your fish for your IDK or your little, little weird things on Cities of Sigma. Like those little basing bits, uh, I, I could see whether it's shoulder pads for my my uh, my space marines, whether it is, you know, basing bits. I, I would love to see a world where my local game store offers me that service because I may not have the space or the dedication to the to the resin 3D printing hobby, which it really does become a hobby. Yeah, uh, it's not easy. Everybody it, thinks that you just click a button like that. Nah, it's not how it works. It's a, it's a hobby in itself, right? But, you know, 3D printing is great for building terrain, for doing terrain. Um, it allows you to... to do you think stores, that's the evolution, or do you think that this is an opportunity for, for local game stores to be able to offer that service um, and it's another way to bring customers in, or is that something that you're like, oh, I don't want to play in that space for this reason? It's it's definitely a viable route, and it's something where we've got a Sigmar tournament coming up. I'll shout this out while we're doing it. Uh, May 11th and 12th, we've got the Sigmar Summit, and it's a golden ticket event, like the winner's going to go to Worlds. And so we're going to have, I don't know, 50, 60 people sign up for that one, ideally. And I'm bringing on my 3D printers into the shop because I need to start printing out a bunch of terrain. Mm. And once we get that in here and, like, we get those churning, like, things are going, like, printing out basing bits, like, these are things that there is a market for that. And it's something that people absolutely would be willing to pay for. The harder part is, like, you can license different sculptors and things like that and just use theirs. Um, if you have your own like sculpts that you can do, like that's even cooler, but just licensing and doing the, the basing bits, like that is a good thing that stores can do. It's people will probably start doing that more in the future. And it's something that we will likely work our way into over time. Yeah. I imagine like, I always, I always have this dream in my head. I always say to myself every so often, I'm like, ah, oh, I should run a game store. And I'm like, what's my point of difference? I'm like, well, Two things that I'd probably offer if I was, and this is like airy fairy, you know, I, I'm clearly not running a store, so it's all ambitious here. But like, I'd love to run a store that one has 3D printing, um, terrain FDM have definitely have to have that. Yeah. But two, resin, just being able to offer a resin service. 
The other thing, if I was able to get the space, is I'd love to have a little podcast area. And I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of people who want to do podcasts where I could rent out a little space and they could record their podcast for their friends. And I always thought those two little things could be a, a point of difference for me, or at least a way to bring in customers other than just selling product, playing games, um, getting demo for, for certain things. Uh, I don't know. Like it just, there's so many different ways you can attract customers and I'm sure there's plenty of great ideas out there. People are listening in and going, my store does this and my store does that. And um, I'd love to hear more about it actually, because again, like high tide lifts all boats. Like one of the things that, you've mentioned jordan and i hear this a lot is people come into a game store as an owner and they don't have a commercial background they are a hobbyist they are a gamer whether they play magic whether they play warhammer whether they play whatever and they start a business because of the love of the game and and i think you know we all want these stores to thrive in a a challenging time and any way you can be profitable without gouging me like I'm, I'm all for, I want you to make money. I want you to be around for a long time. I want you to be successful because that means you reinvest into the tables. You reinvest into better player support for events. You're able to do better discounts. Like whatever it is, I want you to succeed because you have a ripple effect for everyone else. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's it. You, you have to support the place that you're going to go play at. And as long as they're being fair to you, like buying things from them time to time is the fair thing to do as well for sure yeah have you ever looked into i know in the uk i saw this a few times and i've seen it occasionally in australia i don't know if if it's very popular but i've seen memberships to game stores where people pay you like a 100 bucks or whatever it is and you might get an extra discount on top of whatever is already being offered in store and you don't get charged for tables and i know you've already mentioned you don't charge for tables but I've seen places actually charge for tables where it might be five or ten dollars uh, per game or per day. Have you had any thoughts around that from like a profitability point of view? Have you trialed it at all? If you were to offer it to your people, what do you think the the reaction would be if you started charging five dollars? Not to say you are, folks, but it's more like if I'm a business owner and I'm looking at profitability, is it worth maybe upsetting the apple cart by getting extra five bucks, but the perception of you now changes within your community. Open question. That would depend on like, what are other stores in your area doing? So if you're the only store in town that's charging money for tables, people probably just aren't gonna come play there. And that's something where we're in a pretty small town, like we're in Ocala, Florida. It's where I was born and raised. So that's that's why we're here. Like if I moved to Orlando or Tampa or one of the bigger, bigger cities in Florida, we would make more money, but like, this is where I'm from. It's where I like to be. Um, so in the smaller town, like there are three or four other game stores around and nobody charges for the tables. If, if I came in and I tried to charge for tables, I would be labeled the bad guy for sure. And like, it wouldn't pan out. Um, in bigger cities, rent is higher. You have to make more money. And if you need to charge for tables to make things work, that's what you need to do. Um, my suggestion there is just if you're charging money, like these tables need to be sweet. Like they you, you need to be doing something to like make this luxurious, make them feel like they're getting something extra for what they're paying for. Um, for me, like, again, since everything was free, it's not a route that I even explored. Um, like all of those benefits were just giving to you for free at the store anyways. Um, I've had people ask like, well, could we do some sort of membership where like you, we could come in later or like we could stay later. You guys close at 10 and I stay till two. And I think that that's a good idea, but I just don't want to work that late. Um, like so I've got a, yeah, I've got a wife and two kids. Like I love spending time with my family. When I'm not here, that's what that's what I'm doing a hundred with a hundred percent of my time. So like Thursday nights, I'm hanging out with you guys and we're playing Age of Sigmar. But like the other nights, like I need to be at home with my kids, man. Like I stay hanging out to two would be fun, and I would love to do it. Like I love playing games, but I got to get my priorities right. Like that that's the place for me to be. So. Somebody did ask me about, you know, the idea of a 24-7 game store. And in theory, if you think about like the 24-7 gyms, yeah, like you could go in and swipe a buzzer and play with tables. Like that is a concept that could happen. But then you got to remember there's, there's product. And it's yeah, like, so yeah. I'll, I'll hit you with like a, a business idea. Like if I had to start over right now, what I, what I would do if I didn't have a ton of capital, I think my move would be, to try and form some sort of gaming club. 
So there are people that I have this group that are already playing the games. You need to go find somewhere where the rent is cheap, and you need to say, look, guys, it's going to cost us X, Y, Z a month. It's $1,000 a month. There's 10 of us. If we all pay 100 bucks a month, we can get this place. You get it. You turn it into a cool club room. And your buddies are all hanging out. You're having a good time. And you just keep adding people to it over time. And eventually you can turn it into something. So like if, if, if I had to start over today, I think that would be my route going with the membership idea to start with a little bit of capital. And it's something that like you and your friends could viably do. Because especially right out the gate, like there's no employees, like everybody's got a key. We're just going in playing games where we want to play games. By the way, that sounds like a mad pyramid scheme. Like I just thought and <laughs> where it's like, yep, so we all start here and then we, we go we go. Well somebody yeah, people, somebody would have to like, be like the the one being the champion of the store itself, but like getting everybody to sign up at once and like this is what's gonna make it work and then getting more members and then you can start selling products. Like now you have a brick and mortar, right? And so you start working your way up. This is Mway. You're gonna be selling me like vitamins and pills <laughs> and like things that I don't need. I, wait, that's Warhammer. Like I've yeah, got yeah. so many things I don't need. It's uh, oh, man. There's so much you could talk about with this space, and and I think as I as I reflect, and I'm gonna ask you a couple of like wrap up questions in a minute because we could talk forever, and I'm thoroughly enjoying this. But it just shows you. No, I've been to so many different local game stores domestically and internationally i've gone into you know, tra traveling in, in on this channel i've been able to go to what stores in america i've been to stores in the uk i've been to stores in you know germany and uh in um in uh scotland and like in lots of lots of places and no no local game store has been the same there's commonality between the two but there's always subtle differences and I think that's the the wonderful blank canvas that you've got as a store owner, or maybe someone who works in a store. And I've been I've seen plenty of stores where one passionate employee or someone who joins the business is able to shape or bring something to the picture that was never there before. Maybe their their unbridled enthusiasm for uh, kill team. All of a sudden, they're able to build up a kill team league that was never there. But that one champion, that one employee. Uh, bring something unique to the table. So I love the blank canvas kind of approach and um, I, I, just, I, I find it fascinating and like there's so much product that comes out and so many industry conferences of things and there's always new, 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 there's always hype, there's always things going on. But it's like you are this one single source of like my local game store, you've got the thing, you can give me advice, you can help me, you can nurture me, you can uh, connect me with like-minded individuals, you can help host the events, you are a business owner, you are an event planner, you are a marketer, you are a salesperson. There is like so many hats that you wear in one given day that I can't imagine that's easy for you. So, you know, the fact that you're around five years later, absolute testament to you and um, and everyone who who either runs a store or you know is actively contributing yeah like there are always challenges with anything you're going to do but I'll, i will honestly say like i am absolutely living the dream like there is nothing else that i would rather be doing like i told you earlier like i am averaging like i play four or five games of warhammer a week there is no other job on the planet where i would be able to make that happen so like ordering's tough and there's some like I'm spending hours doing this or doing that, and I would do that with any job. So the idea that I get to talk and hang out and play a bunch of games with people, teach people how to play, and then even just the just office chat, like a new article on Warhammer community pops out, like that's what the office is talking about for the day. Everybody's bought in. Like we're 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 living good over here for sure, man. Yeah, and I think this is kind of where initially I just wanted to talk to you about running a game store, and I think the more I thought about it, the more I'm like. I bet you there's a lot of people who are curious about careers in Warhammer, whether it's working at Games Workshop, whether it's working at your local game store, or setting up your own game store, maybe commission painting. And it got me thinking, like, maybe I should do a series of videos exploring, like, what's it like to be a commission painter? Is it is it literally like, like I can't imagine what it's like to be a commission painter. Like, anytime anyone asks a question, they don't value the price. You're like, okay, I'm going to charge you X amount of dollars for the model. You're like, I don't want to pay that. That's too expensive. Yeah. No, what you're, what you're paying for is time. You're paying for expertise. You're paying somebody who has mastered their craft to do a quality standard. If you don't value that price, then 
like it's like it's like hiring a tradesperson to come and you know yeah i could go put up some drywall on my wall but i'm avoiding the mistakes and I've, they've got the tools and like this is what i'm buying i'm buying time not buying drywall yeah the, the world of a commission painter is tough like i like painting like i like painting a hero or two like you hand me a squad of 40 clan rats and like i'll do it but like it's not gonna be a blast and so for them to just be able to sit there and power through like that is valuable man like you don't want to do it that's why you're asking them to do it for you and it's a tough word out there where like people they just don't want to pay like they, i got this little model like as a hero i want to pay you 20 bucks to paint it well that's going to take seven or eight hours to do a good job like i'm not doing it for two dollars an hour like it just doesn't that's work for say. Me. That's, yeah. yeah but like they don't value like if you quote yeah people them, that doesn't that doesn't click for sure if you, you've quoted them, I don't know, I'm going to cost each of $50, $50 or $75 to paint this model. You're like, oh, $75, that's like double the model. Well, actually, yeah, I'm going yeah. to be investing eight hours. If you break that down, that's still like $5 or $10 an hour. Yeah. You're getting more working at like Chick-fil-A. Uh, no, you paint it yourself if you don't value that $70. And yeah, and that, and that's a good point. Like, don't sell yourself short. Like, I have seen even people in our store, like, there's a guys who like to paint they'll paint for stuff on the side and i'll overhear them tell somebody oh like yeah i'll paint that squad of 20 skins for you for 40 dollars and it's like oh man like you're just not like it's not going to be worth it but some of them like they just love painting and they would do it for free anyways so that's how they're looking at it but like if you're trying to go the career route like two dollars an hour is not going to cut it man like you gotta you gotta charge what you're worth and like you are valuable the thing you're doing is valuable it takes a lot of time and technique and skill to do a good job um so definitely make sure you're charging what you're worth and i think that's the same is true for you right like meme had asked me a question around you know you charging and the, and the differences between like do i discount completely like uh, depending on what country you're in you know games workshop has different discount rates but you know if you can offer a 20 percent discount do you offer 20 percent discount do you sell it full price like and what I'm hearing from you is, you know, the overall services that you offer may or may not justify, like, you know what, like I'm doing, as you said, at the top of the show, I do what Games Workshop does, but just better. I'm better at it. <laughs> so, well, then why would I discount myself by 20% as well when I add so much value? So not saying that's, not saying to stop discounting, but yeah, yeah. I guess it's, it's know your worth and know, yeah. uh, know, know what value you add to the community and then stand by it. Yeah, but I will say on the discount tip, like, I'm all in on the discounts. Like, give people the max discount you can. Like, I think that in most cases as a store, you can afford to give people the discount. Like, and people do appreciate it. And if they're in your store, I've seen it. Like, they can look at a price on a product. They'll be on their phone on Amazon at the same time. So, like, if you aren't the same price, like... And in the United States, it's a 15% cap. Like that's the maximum discount we're allowed to offer. And so like, if you're not advertising at that price and selling things at that price, like people are going to shop elsewhere and they're going to feel slighted sometimes. Like, oh, this guy's trying to rip me off. He's trying to charge me this. Um, so like I, I, on a personal level, like I want you to walk out of my store feeling like you got a great deal. I'm giving you the best deal I possibly can. And there are some cases where I'm sure like you can't, like they have to charge full retail to pay their rent. and like. Again, it's your livelihood. You need to do what you need to do. But if you can swing the discount, I think that it does help your business in a big way. And hopefully it leads to cross product, right? It's, it's you know, I came in to buy that box of models. I get that 15% discount. I may go pick up a paint or two, or I might pick up a new uh, brush or a, something extra. Yeah. And overall, I may have actually spent more. I actually may have spent more than I originally, because I felt like I got, got a good deal. So yeah. There's a, there's a psychology of buying in here that I could go into, but like, is that, but I, there's an interesting stat I know when I was looking at sales, sales psychology, that when you give someone, let's say a $50 voucher, like we all get vouchers for birthdays or things like that. Most people will go into the store and spend above the, the, the voucher value because they see it as free money. So they go out and like, the, like the psychology behind it is, is, is pretty crazy. Yeah. A couple of other questions. You, you're still with me. We, yeah, you're good, man. Keep cruising. All right. All right. I swear I thought someone was walking in the door, but guest appearance. <laughs> yeah, just guest this is our office area, so they just came in. But. Guest appearance on the channel. Welcome. <laughs> I'll, I'll come in. It's the friendly side of the game store. 
But a couple of burning questions I've got to kind of bring us home is um, this one's coming from Skaven Spawn. Um, shout out to a Skaven lover. What would you do differently if you had uh, starting capital to invest into Warp Fire Mini? So let's say someone, I don't know, an investor came in and said, here is a bag of cash. Let's start the business. How would you or what would you do differently to start a uh, local game store? Ooh, let me think about that for a second. Uh, if I was starting with like the same amount of capital to start out the gate, or are we talking like we've got $2 million or what are we? Yeah, doing? Look, like <laughs> realist, oh, look, like th that, that wasn't defined, right? So if I yeah. said to you, like, what would you do with $2 million? I think we all know the answer. But, <laughs> I'm retiring, like, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> let, let's say you had a fair amount of money, whatever that is in your country, to start a business the way you'd like to, enough to be able to do the things you wanted to do, rent and maybe renovations and have the right things and, and do the thing, but maybe not enough to be able to like just rest on yeah, your yeah. laurels and kick back. Like a little. Okay. Um, as far as like, if it was things that I would do differently, like I just wouldn't, like I think we did a pretty good job, like things that worked out for us. Um, but like if I was starting with a clean slate and I had like, a normal nest egg of money, like where I'm, I'm able to open a game store. Um, you, I think that for for the regular avenue, you have to like have you have to have that diversity of products. Like even if it's not my favorite thing or like the way that we did it, like I think that it's necessary in order to get going out the gate. Like you're gonna sell that booster box of magic and make X dollars, like you need every dollar you can get right out the gate so you can pay your rent, pay your employees. So like just having a good selection of games that you know people can play, um, having a play space where people can come in and play in your store. Like even if it's one or two tables, like if you have nothing, then it, it gives you the image of like, well, you don't even care about people playing. And that's, you hear stories about like games are telling people they can't play in their store. And it's like, what, what universe are we living in where that's okay? Like you just can't. Um, so diversity of products, having play space for people um and then it's a lot it's a lot of it's just going to come down on your shoulders like again like if you are welcoming and warm with people that's what they're going to respond to more than even your like selection of products if if there's a new game store in town people are going to come check you out and like that first time they walk in the door that's your opportunity to show them what you're about and what you guys are doing at your place so make it something you're passionate about uh, make it something you love like people they can pick up on that and see it and make sure you have extra money like things just cost more than you think they do and the extra like the rent and the insurance and the employees and then workers comp and all of these things they just add up in ways that you don't necessarily anticipate and so if you're thinking you need this amount of money like you're going to just need more and don't expect to come in and just kill it right out the gate. Like, I don't know any game store in the universe that has done that. Just like open the doors and boom, they're millionaires. Like it just doesn't work. Um, what else you got? I don't know. Like I, I think the I was, I was actually just reflecting on your journey going from you know just flipping sales from a buy and sell to eventually you know army trading in to eventually the the um, storage. Uh, box to your store I was just wondering like if you started day one from a hobby store the biggest thing that you're missing even though you might have capital would be relationships now, for sure not bringing, yeah. if you if you were the local games workshop manager and you set up your own business you have relationships to bring over but you're able to foster them somewhere else because otherwise all you're doing is competing on price or you just got to really ramp up your marketing efforts to, to get the word out and you're competing with everyone else. And if I'm in the hobby, I probably already have a local game store. So how do I attract those customers? And I think that the story of relationship, if nothing more over these last almost two hours, we have a story of relationships and, um, I really like it. I think that's the that's the core of our game. It's yeah, one hundred percent. Like just being a part of the community, helping that community, and like doing everything good that you can for the community. Like that is a hundred percent your best bet. I imagine if you you know if you had the capital as well, 
being more involved in the community, being able to sponsor tournaments, being able to, you know, donate to, to various clubs to get them off the ground. I'm sure if if time and money permitted, you're, you're able to, again, support the people who are supporting you. But that's a definitely a fine balance and certainly a challenge that I imagine, again, you haven't got the mansions or the, or the boats just yet. But because <laughs> um, I know for me, like, you know, I, I, t- I talked, I, I run a tournament, I'm entering my fifth year now as a, as a grand tournament, and I always talk to my local game stores, I'm like, well, what can you do for me? And it seems like most of them are just offering me a, you know, a, a fairly similar offer. And I know the one that stands out for me the most, um, shout out to Emerald, is um, I never forget the day I said to Emerald, hey, Emerald, you know, uh, uh, Emerald Games, I'm looking for tournament support. And they said, look, we're not going to give you extra product, but what we're going to give you is a box and they gave me curse city they said we're going to give you curse city but what we'd appreciate is if you uh generated some donations for us you can pick you can pick the where, where the donations go but you know instead of giving this product out to just give it to a winner who may or may not appreciate it we'd love you to do something good with it i'm like you know what you're the type of people i want to work with that's the type of thing that i i love and when I think about the again, it comes back to relationships. It comes yeah. back to, to, to community. So, um, yeah, and and that's a big takeaway for them. Like, and for all the stores, is so it's not always about the money, man. Like, handing you the Curse City box, like they're they're handing it to you, just knowing like we could just get nothing for this in return. And like, sometimes that's the risk you have to take in order to be successful. Like, I'm gonna pay this amount of money for advertising. It's the same thing. Like, you're handing these people this prize support, and you're hoping that your goodwill will then turn into more goodwill. And more often than not, it does. Yeah. Yeah. No, invest in the people who invest in you. Yeah. If I wanted to work at a store like yours, let's say I don't aspire to own the store, but maybe I'd love to become part time or eventually full time working at a local game store. What advice would you give me to to get that job? Should I wait for a job application on a board and, and you know go through a, a traditional resume structure? Do I just walk in and just harass you for a job? Like, talk to me more about what do you look for with somebody, skills, knowledge, whatever. So the best thing you could do is just be a part of that community. So like if if I walk around and I have hired a couple of our employees or just and like I pulled them to the side one day, like, and like, would you be interested in working with us one day? And they were just members of the community who I could watch their interactions with people and just say like, hey, that's a good person. And more important than like your knowledge of the product or any of those things, like me seeing that you were kind to someone or that you helped out in a situation where maybe you didn't need to help out in, like that's what people are looking for. And just do that. Like, just go in. If like, you, if you know the knowledge and you got all this product stuff, that's great too. I definitely wouldn't harass me about a job. But like, if you are, are part of the community and you're we're chit chatting one day and you you just mentioned like, hey man, like I'd love to work for you one day. Like, I will hear that. I will take it to heart. And when our when our business can afford to, like, we'll make that happen for you. It's so like that. That has been the story for a couple of our employees. Like Kill Team Ben, he was just coming in and hanging out and like. I watched him interact with people like, man, this is a good person. I'd love to have him on the team. And so I asked him about it and we made it happen. I've seen it also happen with people who are just like, look, I'm willing to run that Blood Bowl tournament for you. Like if we do a Blood Bowl tournament once a month and that champion, as you called them, uh, eventually leads to the the store going, look, how about I pay you? How about I put you on the roster? I give you one day a month. And if you run the as an employee, as opposed to a champion or I think even like Magic the Gathering, and I've seen this in Age of Sigma as well, where you may not get physical dollars, but they give you store credit to to for, for, to thank you for your judging and your time. And yeah, um, yeah. If you show the store owner that like you are a consistent person who shows up and does what he says he's going to do, like that is every employer's dream. It's like you showed up on time and you did what you were supposed to do without me like be, being over your shoulder about it. So that's yeah, do that, man. You're in. Are there any particular upcoming releases, new product lines? You know, you've obviously got an Age of Sigma background. So is there anything in particular that you're excited or you'd recommend people check out that's either been pitched to you in your store? Like, you you must see a lot. You must see a lot of things. Man, I get pitched games all the time. And, like, again, like, I'm just 
jumper like warhammer is what i love so like i turned down a ton of games that are coming out um as far as for like warhammer releases that are coming up in the near future hopefully like if tradition stays like we should be seeing a new edition of age of sigmar coming out in this summer at this point. um if that does happen like i'm ultra pumped for that very curious to see what they do or don't do um I know the season overall, people are kind of ready for a change. We were we were hoping for the battle scroll was going to be a little bit bigger of a change around here, and it wasn't. But like the game's still good, we're still having fun. But like when fourth edition drops, if it does this summer, that's going to be a big like surge of interest, and people will be very excited to see what that is. What about non Warhammer stuff? Like put, let's put Warhammer to the side for a second. <laughs> it could be Warhammer adjacent, but. Yeah, yeah. Is there any product lines where there's painting uh, tools or uh, a new, you know, any, anything un, un Warhammer you're excited about? Yeah, so for things that aren't Warhammer, like we do carry the Pro Curl paints. We recently brought those in a couple months ago. And yeah, Chef's Kiss, like beautiful. Now that they've been in the store, like anytime that I'm personally painting, if there's a shade of any of theirs that is appropriate, like I'm, I find myself using it first every time like especially the white the bull titanium white is incredible i'm um, obsessed with the cover with the bronze yeah I've yeah never, all this I've all never, the like dark silver and stuff like that are great i've never found a good bronze until i found that and i i, I all of a sudden my my palette went from golds and silvers to gold silvers and bronze like that yeah yeah. And so, pro acryl. yeah and so they came out with like a fluorescent line recently so i've been using that and it's pretty cool too um there's a new wave of two thin coat paints coming out I haven't used those myself, but a, a lot of the guys in the office have used them and they really like them. So we'll bring that in whenever it launches where stores can get it. Um, Pro Curl, we got in like some of their tools. We got like the razor blade was actually really nice. Um, the brushes, we got some of the brushes in. Those have been pretty good. But brushes are a tricky one with me. Like a lot of times I just use the cheap, the cheapos, man. Like it's a dollar or two a brush. And like if it goes bad, move on to the next one so I, the pro crow brushes we got them in i took a set home and like I, i'm giving those the the true effort here the college try and they're nicer for sure um i think i'm gonna feel really good about it if they last a really long time and so so far like they have already lasted longer than those cheap brushes but i need to see them keep going a little longer before i start preaching to the choir i know one thing i've really become obsessed with lately is um asian uh, Asian products, specifically like from the Japanese gunpla type of product line, and just mm -hmm. seeing so many really interesting. Like, obviously, I, I love Tamiya uh, glue. Like, the Tamiya plastic glue is mm -hmm. the best glue out there in the market. But even little things, and I might have mentioned this in a previous discussion, you might, people might or might not remember, but I remember finding, like, you know, Q tips, you know, the way you clean your ears with yeah. like, cotton butts. You can buy little ones for painting eyes. So it's like a little little dot and just like just mm. perfectly does does the eye dot. And it looks literally like a Q-tip, but obviously very focused. And if you look at what the, the gunpla, whether it's the, the snippers, whether it's certain products, they've got some really cool things out there. So things that like a Warhammer definitely adjacent, but yeah. aren't actually in our community. And like this is this is this is good stuff. Yeah, we're, we're looking into those things. Like anytime I go to the events, like I'm always walking around the little vendor booth and I'm talking to people and seeing what they have and what they don't have. So uh, we went down at LVO. Gosh, what was the name of it? They had another company there. Game, that, Game of Grass? No, Game of Grass. We got those guys already. That They, they have really good stuff. Like they, they are the best tufts on the market. The pre-made yeah. bases are beautiful. Um, I'll, I'll remember it later, but they had a, a line of different paints and basing effects and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm, I'm talking to them, seeing if we can work something out. Like, I'm always looking to bring in more things that are Warhammer related. Um, so I'm keeping my own things. I, I, I like to get it in and try it myself first before I bring it into the store. Like, if I don't love it, I'm just not going to sell it to you. So Games Workshop brushes are a good example. Like, I have bought them. I think that they're fine. But, like, I don't know that it's a $15 brush. So, like, I'm not going to have it in my store. It's funny, actually, because I'll either go for something cheap, like an army painter's brush, or I'll go the other end, like, you know, Artis Opus or, you know, yeah. other, other like, you know, um, in Sable or um, uh, the Rosemary brushes where if I'm going to go that expensive, I'll go that way. Or, yeah, it, it's one of the brushes often are just convenience. Yeah. Anything. 
So it's something we're always like, I'm looking out for the next greatest thing. Like, and if you're a customer and there's something that you wish we had in our store, like just email me about it. Like I go through, I am the one who checks the emails. Like I will look at it and see, like, I'll probably buy it for myself and check it out and see if it's something we can throw in there. No, I like it. I like it. And that's how we expose you to new products as well. And maybe yep. we all, we all yeah, I can't be everywhere. I don't know everything. So like, yeah, please show me what you guys like and we'll, we'll do what we can. If you don't have Tamiya plastic glue, please go get it. Do me a okay. personal favor. Do you not have it? I don't have Tamiya. Yeah, we got just the regular single, Citadel stuff. single, single-handedly the greatest plastic glue. And I'll fight anyone on the internet for <laughs> okay. it. Okay. And, and then at the end, like when, as you're getting like right to it, it's a little glass bottle and um, the, the plastic glue is incredible and it's very fairly priced. But, um, and you'll hear Vince Ventrell talk about sprue glue. You literally just put, put your old sprues in there as well, and the, the sprue melts with the plastic. So whenever you're trying to like um, uh, blend any any bits or any gaps, you can use a sprue glue, and it, it, it's perfect. Like it's, yeah, it's I've seen that before. That's real neat. Yeah. Tell me out. Number one. <laughs> All right. You got La- it. Last question. You're not going to do it. <laughs> I mean, hey, I need, I'm, I'm going to make it happen. You watch. Don't make me bring a, don't make me bring a, a pot of Tamiya glue with me to the next World Championships just for you to test it. <laughs> Last question, and then you can do shout outs. What can we do to support our local game store? So on behalf of all the local game stores out there in the world, what can I, the consumer, the gamer, the, the, the friend of the, the game store, what can I do to help keep you around and keep you thriving? I would say the best thing you can do is just go there. Like if you are there and you are a positive light in the community, like if you are friendly to people, if you're hanging out and you're showing people how to play the game or even just talking about the game. Like we have plenty of people who just come in the store. They're just sitting down at a table, not even playing. Like they'll hang out for four or five hours, just chit chatting about Warhammer and stuff. And when people see other people in the store, like it gives them the opportunity. Now I can engage in this conversation. And again, it's just good for the human spirit to be involved and around other people. So Number one, just just be a positive influence on the community as a whole and participate in the things that they do. Like sometimes stores will go out on a limb and like, let's say I do that painting class. And if nobody shows up, I'm probably not going to do another painting class. Like I, I gave it a go. I lost some money doing this and trying. So even if it's, if it's something that maybe you don't love it, like it's going to be an experience and like go out, give it a try and like try to participate in the things that your store is trying to do. It it takes a lot of effort and a lot of people's time to do any of these things. Like putting on an event, people think it just happens, but like, man, it's a lot of work getting all that terrain together and getting the table set up and the objective markers down. And there's so much going on behind the scenes that you don't really know about or appreciate. So participating in things your store does. And then when you can like shop local with your guys, like if you're playing there, definitely shop there. Um, if they don't have what you're looking for and you need it right away, like check it out, warpfireminis.com, like we'll get it to you as quick as we can, but you do need to support those places that you're playing at. Like they need it, like, and it's the right thing to do. And I imagine asking them, like, even don't assume that just cause you can't see it, you're like, Hey, I really want to buy that Tamiya glue. Um, you know, yeah. do you stock it? You're like, no, but I've got to restock with my supplier and my st- supplier does have it on the, on the inventory options maybe I'll test the water by buying a box. So, yeah, a lot A lot of times we have access to a lot of things that we don't carry in stock all the time. So like if, if there's something you're looking for, yeah, ask your store owner about it. Like no one is going to be offended by you asking and like we're going to try to make it happen for you. And we, you know, one of my local stores recently had that where, where somebody asked to get some Green Stuff World product in and now all of a sudden that category has gotten so big that it's actually got a whole whole section on the shelf where there's you know the the tentacle things and the basing things and there's a whole various bunch of product from green stuff well all started because somebody asked can you get me this in so um just because you don't have it doesn't mean they can't get it so yeah ask first ask first anything else anything else i can do to help you and your uh your comrades uh thrive as a business owner i'm like just tell your friends and stuff like if you're passionate about the hobby like you want other people to participate in the hobby. Like it's fun playing your friends, but eventually like we've done this same game over and over and over again, like playing new people and meeting new people. Like it's the best thing you do for the hobby. Like just, just getting other people involved. So tell your friends, even if it's something they may not be interested, like, Hey man, just like, just come down one day and just check it out. Like watch us roll some dice. Like 
if you don't want to play, that's cool. Maybe you, maybe you just want to put stuff together. It's like Legos, right? Or maybe you just like painting. Like art is good for people. Um, so there's lots of different aspects of the hobby that people could be involved in. So just telling people about it, sharing it with them. Don't overload them and like, oh, well, here's the lore about 40K in the Grim Dark future and launch into a tirade. But telling people and sharing your hobby with people, even if it's like putting up pictures of your painted models on social media, stuff like that, like all of those little things, they help the hobby at large, which will in turn help your local game stores too. I know something that I do a lot is I'll take photos of games and even just like when we run little RTTs, take photos of the, the, the crowd at the RTTs and then share it with the wider, the wider community. So my, my um, Sydney is where I live and, you know, Sydney has a, a big Facebook uh, of Age of Sigma. You know, for the people who are missing out this particular month, I go, hey, here's all the photos, here's things that are going on. So hopefully that inspires you to get up your ass and come next month. Yeah, next time, like, man, I missed out, I got to be there. Yeah. Correct, correct. Or, hey, there's a really cool vibe that I want to get involved with. I'm going to go check it out where um, where maybe without those photos that or they haven't been tagged that they wouldn't share, that I wouldn't come over. So that's something that cost me nothing to do. Yeah. That hopefully goes a long way. Yep, absolutely. Anything else? Um, as far as helping us out, like that's pretty much it, man. Like if, if you're, if you're supporting us by buying stuff in the store, sometimes you're telling your friends about it and you're a really good positive influence when you're here. Like there is nothing more I could ask from you. Like you are, you are the perfect customer. Thank you very much. Well, if I can help you a little bit, Jordan. Um, so as I've already mentioned at the top of the channel, uh, the show, uh, Jordan does have an incredible YouTube channel that is criminally underrated. Uh, 3,000 view uh, subscribers. I want to see that hit five uh, ASAP. Uh, go subscribe to Warpfire Minis. Great channel. Uh, AOS very focused. You'll see you've done LVO recaps. You've done some tactics. You've done a, a review on the battle scrolls. There's a lot of cool things that you could be talk you've talked about that is uh, more than just trying to sell you a product. In fact, I don't see any product sale, selling stuff here. It's just you and your experience, and um, uh, people love your battle reports and people love um, your insight. So uh, that's genuine. I, 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 I included. I am subscribed, as you can see there. Uh, the I other one, obviously, yeah. I'm definitely subscribed. Imagine it wasn't. That would be that would just lose <laughs> all credibility immediately. Uh, the other one being, uh, go check out the website. And by the way affiliate link. Uh, if you do happen to shop with Warfire Minis and you click the AOS coach link, uh, you will be supporting my channel as well as supporting Jordan's business and supporting yourself by buying product at, at, a, at a fair price. Yeah. And I wanted to say thank you, Mr. AOS coach. Like and I'm meeting you at events and stuff. Like you, you've always been that, that a positive light. People gravitate towards you. Like they really like being around you and talking to you. You are an, a definite asset to the hobby. And like, oh. I know I initially reached out to you like, Hey man, like let's work together. Like, what can we do? Because I look at you and I say, like, this is a good person. This is a guy who's bringing that positive energy. You don't live in the United States. I can't give you a job, but like anything we can do to work together. Like, I think I think you're a good person for the hobby. I really appreciate what you do. And then anybody, yeah, if you shop with us, click the AOS coach, the affiliate link down there. That, that way you're supporting coach too. Like, it's the right thing to do. Let's do it. Appreciate it. And uh, it's all going into some very exciting things for the back half of the year. So uh, very excited. I actually started looking at uh, literally hot off the press. I don't know if I should, I know if I should <laughs> be saying this. Like the other night I was actually doing some maths to work out like what would happen if I step back from my job and start pulling more time into the channel. Like what if I was to drop back to nine days a fortnight? Could I, could I do battle reports with one day and could I edit things and have two battle reports a month? So Things are working. Things are working. Yeah. It's not, that's, not if you keep this series going of the the careers in the in the hobby here, like commission painters are cool, stores are cool, like the YouTube personality, the the influencer here, like we would love to hear your side of the story too. See what see what it takes. Maybe I really, you know what I really want to do. I want to talk to someone at Games Workshop. I want to see if I can pull what's it like working at Games Workshop. Might have to go with someone like an ex-employee. But I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah, curious yeah. to see, like, because some people might aspire to work in Games Workshop, whether it be not just the retail store, but you see um, army painters like the heavy metal team or maybe someone that works in the presenters. Like, how do I get a job with GW? And for those who are wanting to relocate, what does it take? But that's not yeah. your video. That's the... Yeah. That's the I'm subscribed though. I'm going to check that one out. If you get that one, I'm definitely going to watch that one. And one quick thing for, for Games Workshop employees, like 
I know that they catch a lot of flack. Like as a lot of people will look at Games Workshop and say they're the bad guy, but like the people that work there are wonderful. Like our our reps that we deal with, like they don't want these bad things to happen sometimes, and they're human beings, man, and like they're trying their best, and we appreciate all they do. And at large, like the game is a great game. The models are awesome. Like they could turn the cold shoulder and not give us any updates or do anything, and we would probably still buy it. So like they're putting an effort. We love what they're doing most of the time. <laughs> It's sometimes just their processes. Sometimes yeah. it is not the people. It's not someone sitting there going, ha, 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 I'm going to screw up this person's order. It's yeah, nobody has ever great. been malicious to me in any way, shape, or form for like any people who work at Games Workshop. It's been great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ask you two final questions. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not going to let you away at this one. <laughs> You're a Skaven man. Yes. If you could add one thing to the Skaven roster, what do you want to see on Skaven? For Skaven, I'm a big fan of the Vermin Lords, so I like the big rats. So I would like to see a Scryer version of a Vermin Lord that's more shooting focused. It's like we got the Warbringers, like the Clan Verminus, that's the melee stuff. We got Pestilence, that one's not very good. But a Scryer big shooty rat would be an awesome thing to see. Okay. And while we're talking at Games Workshop, if you ever got a job at Games Workshop, where would you work? Um... At the top, man. Put, put, put me in the driver's seat. Like, I'm ready. I talk to our rep all the time. Like, man, like, I'll drive up to Tennessee is where their warehouse is right now and, like, help you guys out. With with all these shipping delays that have been happening, even now, I tell like, man, I will get a U-Haul. Like, I'm bringing the Warfire team up. Let us pack our own boxes, man. Like, we got to make things happen. But the biggest thing, like, put me in PR somewhere where I can communicate with the people. Just tell people what's going on. If I If they put out one Warhammer community article just saying, like, hey, guys, this is why things have slowed down. Like just so much life is so much better for every store, every customer. Like just tell us what's going on, man. Yeah. I think communication is definitely where I'd love to be. Like, especially yeah. like be a bit more upfront. Sometimes things happen, but just be upfront with it. Just, just, just it's better than yeah, just like put out a funny happen. James workshop video about he clicked the wrong button on the order. It's like, just give us anything, man. And we're going to love it. I'm with you. Yeah. Jordan, thank you so much for your time. I know it's late on a Friday. You've got family things to do. Uh, go spend time. Go paint some Skaven. And um, I hope everyone goes check out your channel. Again, walk by minis. Go check them out. Go buy a product if that's your local store. Go support your local game store. This is not just a way to get people to go buy from, from Jordan. Yeah, if yeah. you do, that would be awesome. But ultimately, if, if I was to, to wrap this up, I want you to support your local game store. I want you to understand how the ecosystem works and what you can do and bring that to the table. And if you want to support me and, and, and um, Walkfire, please go click the link, go below and uh, do the YouTube stuff and go go support him. Go go click on um, subscribe on Walkfire Minis on YouTube channel. You will not be disappointed. Uh, but Jordan, thank you so much for your time. Hope you all enjoyed the discussion. And if you want to hear more things about Warhammer careers, let me know in the comments if there's things in particular, like if, if the commission painting, you would be curious to, for me to explore commission painters or maybe you know someone who might be a really good guest or maybe if you do want to understand more about what it's like to work in GW, tell me um, and uh, I may make actually make this a series. Uh, cool. All right, I'm off. Have a good right. day. Thanks, thank everyone. you, man. Bye. Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you press like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spell cast.